Welcome to Lake County, home of California's largest natural freshwater lake, Clear Lake. Originally called Hobbiton, meaning big water and native Pomo, Clear Lake is one of the oldest lakes in North America. Clear Lake has over 120 miles of shoreline with shallow and rich waters that makes it a world-class fishing destination. The productive waters of Clear Lake have produced record-catching fish, which contributes to the average 15,000 boaters that visit Clear Lake every year. Clear Lake is currently free of invasive quagga and zebra mussels. Monthly monitoring by Lake County's Water Resources staff help to maintain Clear Lake's mussel-free status. If invasive quagga or zebra mussels are introduced into Clear Lake, their devastating impacts will last forever. Mussels consume massive amounts of green algae when they filter feed lake water, which will decimate the sport fishing population as green algae is the base of the food web in Clear Lake. Mussels can attach to and clog drinking water pipes causing millions of dollars to the public and private sector to pay for needed maintenance and removal. For the drinking water systems on the lake, this is especially concerning as Clear Lake provides drinking water to about 66% of the county's population. Added cost to remove mussels would make drinking water treatment more difficult and expensive. There are no examples of successful eradication of invasive mussels from lakes. Meaning, if quagga or zebra mussels are introduced into Clear Lake, they will be here forever, and the Clear Lake as we know it today will never be the same again. There are three simple things we can do to prevent the introduction of invasive mussels. Before leaving any water body, remember to clean your boat inside and out, and all compartments. Remove any plants, dirt, or sand. Drain your engine. Pull your drain plug and empty any water from ballast tanks or live wells. Dry your boat, including inside compartments, and make sure all equipment, including water toys and fishing gear, are completely dry before visiting another water body. Every boat launching in Lake County needs to be screened and stickered. Find participating screeners and sticker sellers online at www.nomuscles.com. Dot com. When visiting a sticker seller, the boater will fill out a single page screener form. The screener will verify that the boat is safe to launch in Lake County and does not have mussels or has not recently been in a mussel infested lake. If a boat is high risk or likely to have mussels, an inspection is needed and the vendor will call a certified watercraft inspector from the county and they will perform an inspection on the boat for free. Once a boat passes screening and or inspection, boaters will purchase a sticker for $20. The County of Lake Quagga Muscle stickers are located next to the Yearly California State sticker, which will be adhered to both sides of the bow, next to the registration numbers and the state's muscle fee sticker, as well as at the back of the trailer. Please report any violators without current Quagga Muscle stickers. Even screen boats will sometimes be stopped at the ramps by ramp monitors for quality assurance. Sometimes, muscle sniffing dogs will also be present at the ramps to conduct impromptu inspections. This step won't take long, but it's important so that we can continue to protect Clear Lake from invasive mussels. If you have any other questions or you think you see a quagga or zebra mussel in Clear Lake or in another water body in Lake County, you can call us at Water Resources at 707-263-2344. You can send us an email at water.resources at lakecountyca.gov. Or you can send us a message on Facebook. Find us at Lake County Water. Thanks for helping us keep Clear Lake clear of invasive mussels. And with your help, we can protect and preserve Clear Lake for future generations of people, plants, and animals. Thanks to our funding partners at the California State Parks Division 
of Boating and Waterways for supporting this program and PSA. Hey, good morning and welcome to the February 14th Board of Supervisors meeting. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, start with a moment of silence. Does anybody have a moment of silence? The earthquake. I, I know looking at the, um, the death toll from the Turkey and Syrian earthquakes is almost half the population of our county and it's really hard for me to wrap my, my mind around that and I know we're all sending all of our support to our, our friends in the Middle East and then there was another university shooting this morning at MSU so we will uh, dedicate our moment of silence to them. Robert Sark, will you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any extra items not appearing on the agenda? Okay, we will move on to number five, approval of consent agenda. Anything? I know we, we need to move 5.5 to a later date. Anything else? Yes, I would like to pull item 5.1 for further discussion, 5.2, um, 5.8, and 5.9 will come back at a later agenda after speaking with the director of yeah, pro uh, chief probation officer. Right, those two will be pulled and so 5152 and 58 are for later. Uh, public comment or does the public want to pull any items from the consent agenda? Not seeing any in the participants in Zoom. So we'll bring it back to the board for action. Madam Chair, I move to approve consent agenda items 5.3, 5.4, 5.6, 5.7, and 510 through 5.12. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, consent agenda is approved. We will move just a minute until 9.06 for our Public input. <clears throat> okay, it's 9.06. We will open public input. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have Tom Slate. Okay. And you can come to the microphone, state your name, and have three minutes. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, Mr. Green, welcome to the Board of Supervisors. My name is Tom Slate, and I live in Cobb, and I moved there um, January of 84. And I've, I, I had a scanner back then, a radio scanner, and I've had some over the years. And I'm retired, and I'm home a lot, and I have the scanner on most of the time. And in the background, I don't pay too much attention to the calls come in 24-7. But I have noticed it seemed to me, and I could be mistaken, that it seemed to be about four months ago there was a lot more vehicle accidents than usual. And then I began to realize later, over the last four months, it seemed to me some of them uh, single car, single vehicle accidents, like people running into poles and people with rollovers. And I could be wrong. The other thing that I seemed to notice that I had never thought about before was falls. And it seemed to me that I'm hearing a lot of falls 
and head injuries, falls with head injuries, falls with facial injuries. A recent one was fall and failure to respond. I may be completely wrong on this. I don't know. I'm a little hesitant to say all this, but that would be there would be a record of all this on the 911 calls. And one thing I'll add to that as a possibility is if some of these are due to people losing consciousness, could be an ex explanation if there is an increase in falls, and if there is an increase, in, especially in single car accidents or in or vehicle accidents or any kind of accidents, a, a possible uh, loss of consciousness increases. And I'll just leave it at that. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Any other public input? Okay, not seeing any. And we have two minutes until our 910 item. Oh, 5.8. Okay. Uh, let's move to 5.8. Approve amendment number three to the agreement between the County of Lake and Management Connections for temporary clerical personnel in the County of Lake Human Resources Office to amend the minimum hourly rate of compensation and authorize the chair to sign. Supervisor Spadier. Thank you very much. So I pulled this item because we're changing the um, pay for the office assistance based on California state law, but within the amendment it states that we are entering into this agreement on the 14th day of February, and then it speaks only of one other date, which is when we started this agreement, which was August 23rd, and I feel it needs to say as of January 1st, this is the rate of pay where right now that's not what it says, and I don't think we should be paying people state law as of February 14th. I think we need somewhere in there to specify when this starts, uh, rather than just changing the rates without a start date. So that was my request for a change. Oh, Pam? Good morning. Pam Samak, Director of HR. The reason the date starts as the 14th is because that's when we ran out of funds on the last agreement. Um, and we are paying them the appropriate state amount. Um, it's just that that's when we ran out of the first 25,000 of funds. So they, they have been paid properly since January 1st. But I thought in the memo it stated that we changed also the hourly rates for the uh, assistance on there? We did because the minimum wage went up, but the reason the agreement starts on the 14th is because that's when we ran out of funds. Okay. Any other comments? Public input? I'm not seeing any. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for action. to move we approve amendment number three to the agreement between the county of lake and management connections and authorize the chair to sign second a motion and a second all in favor aye aye, aye. opposed okay motion passes thank you and now it's 9 11 so we can go to our 9 10 item which is presentation of proclamation designating the month of February 2023 as Black History Month and celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday. County of Lake, State of California proclamation designating the month of February 2023 Black History Month and celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday. 
Whereas the Lake County branch of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, will celebrate a combination of Black History Month and Martin Luther King's Birthday Month as we reflect on the proud legacy of courage and dedication from visionary leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Jimmy Jackson, Elijah Cummings, African American military veterans, and the NAACP has been at the forefront of protecting voting rights of people of color in this country and continue addressing voter suppression, gerrymandering, and urging the passing of the John Lewis Voters Rights Ad Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act which includes the restoration of the 1965 Voting Rights Act will ensure all citizen voting rights and protected under the United States Constitution. And whereas the NAACP history is one of dedication and struggle to maintain equality and justice for all citizens in the United States and Whereas the local branch, like other NAACP branches throughout the state and country, diligently work on social programs aimed toward the elimination of racial hatred, bigotry, and poverty. And whereas the Lake County branch of the NAACP is led by Rick Mayo, president and 1982 founder of the Lake County branch. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that February 2023 is designated Black History Month and the Lake County branch of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People is commended on the vital role it has played in improving the quality of life in our local communities and that the branch should be extended best wishes and continued success. Pass and adopted this 14th day of February 2023. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been doing this a long time with this, with the County of Lake. NAACP is celebrating its 114th year anniversary this month and being in existence in the United States. Um, we've uh, come a long way over the years. We still have a lot of work to do uh, here in our community and NAACP looks forward to working with this board, with this county, with the, with the local community over in Clear Lake as well, uh, to achieve better working environments, less hot hostility. I know how that is. You know, we agree to disagree, but everybody kind of don't see that from time to time. But I want to thank uh, the board, thank the County of Lake for extending this courtesy as they have done over the years. Thank you very much. Oh, Rick Mayo, Lake County Branch President and Founder, 1982. Thank you, so Thank you. Do we have any members of the public that wish to speak? Or board members? Okay. Thank you. I'll say something real quick. I appreciate the work that I've seen Rick do, especially in the city of Clear Lake. Uh, I know firsthand the relationship that he's built within the police department uh, to ensure there's equity and there's that perspective of seeing things from different, pers uh, different directions. Uh, we need that. We continue to strive for that and appreciate the work he's done. I know that I've seen it firsthand, and I hope it continues. Thank you. And uh, just wanted to state, Rick, wanted to thank you as well. I've been a, a, been a part of the group now for about uh, six months, um, just getting settled in. But uh, your work goes, you know, it goes a long way, and we appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate all the hard work. You've always been uh, just a great advocate, so thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. She wants to get in on this. Let's zoom in. I'm not on zoom, so. You want to open? Yeah. Cool. Picture takes priority. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> oh, this is the moment. Yes, we captured it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Joanne, would you like to give your comment? Wait, 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 wait. He's out of here. Yeah, he, he said he had I'm so grateful yeah. that you're here you accepting go. this 
acknowledgement and presentation for Black History Month. Um, I just want to let folks know that I serve on the Lake County Community Vision Forum Planning Committee, uh, which is a committee that the board, um, it's an ad hoc committee that the board uh, put into power a couple of years ago uh, with the hopes of looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion here in Lake County. And we'll actually be um, sharing more information about that soon. But but we, of course, invite um, our local representatives from the NAACP to, uh, to join us in these efforts to make sure that everyone in Lake County has an equal opportunity to be as successful and happy as they can. So I just want to thank you for this um, acknowledgement to uh, to the work that the local chapter of the NAACP has done uh, towards um, equity and and bringing these um, issues to our awareness and I'm just grateful that the board is acknowledging that and and holding it seriously and and that means a lot to know that the board holds this seriously so thank you thank you Thank you, sir. Okay, we will move on to our 6.3 item, 9.20 a.m., presentation of a Brown Act refresher and related changes Just in the, la, what, oh, sorry. It's not quite 9.20 yet. Oh, it's not. However, you may want to take up 5.1 since Terry is in the chambers. Okay, 5.1. Uh, um, approve the letter of support for Assembly Bill 297, Wildfires Local Assistance to Grant Program Advance Payments and authorize the chair to sign. It's a, it's a yeah. Thank you very much. So I pulled this item not because I don't think that AB 297, I think, uh, Terry logs in for helping me out in finding the correct 297 as I was trying to find the actual text of it. Um, I, I approve of what the bill is offering and uh, what it can do to help us. There, there, there's, and I'm sorry to pull it for being nitpicky like this, but there's just a sentence in there that I feel that we can change. And I, I, I may put my foot in my mouth here, but I'm going to project Supervisor Simon that always says we can make our own story. And here it says, you will be aware Lake is one of the most under-resourced and impoverished California counties. And I don't like saying that again and again and again, and I'd like to cross that out. We're asking to, for them to approve for the resources to be available to not just us, but every county in California. And I think we should twist it into a positive way that we are being proactive in mitigating future disasters, and this bill will help us. I think is a much better way to approach this rather than saying, help us, we're poor. Um, I just think that we have our own ways to uh, twist this story around and so wanted to see how the board felt about that uh, that sentence just kind of stabbed me in the heart you have a uh, did I miss the what was your microphone fix? On? oh I apologize so the the fix is on the second paragraph second sentence it says you will be aware lake is one of the most under-resourced and impoverished California counties I'd like to cross that out and say we are proactively mitigating future disasters and this bill will help Yeah, I, I got no problem with the fix. Maybe, um, and, and I understand the intention of the, uh, you know, the sentence as you put it in there, Terry, but we could say you'll be aware Lake County is being proactive. Having the disasters in there might be a good, you know, the debt. It, it, it kind of says that right before that, since 2015, destructive okay. wildfires have consumed. Perfect. I'm good with the change. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? I'm fine with the change. Okay, public input. I'm not seeing any. 
Okay, bring it back to the Board for Action. Madam Chair, I move to approve the letter of support for AB 297 as amended. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the item passes. And now we can... Go to our 920 item. I'll read it again. Presentation of a Brown Act refresher and related changes in the law effective 2023 County Council. Good morning, board. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, it's weird being here. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm going to get through it. Johanna is loading up a PowerPoint, which I did myself, so I'm responsible for any glitches or, or problems if you cannot read it. But as she's doing that, because I know time is an issue, today I'm just going to give a very brief refresher course on the Brown Act. Uh, I don't believe that your board actually needs that. You're very proficient. Brown Act, but it never hurts to have a few reminders. Then I'm also going to be talking about some, there it is, uh, some recent developments in the laws, uh, particularly Assembly Bill 2449 and Senate Bill 1100. So the Brown Act was authored by Ralph M Milton Brown. Uh, and it was passed in 1953, and it was designed to safeguard the public's right to access and transparency. There were cases where meetings of substance were held in, in what can only be called smoky back rooms, where a bunch of fellows decided to discuss all the business that the public was then going to have to pay for. The Brown Act sought to uh, prevent that from happening, and you'll find the Brown Act beginning in Government Code Section 54950. The intent of the Brown Act, I think, is actually, as it's, as it's referenced in the law, is actually quite poetic. Uh, the people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what's good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so they may retain counsel, control over the instruments they have created. And that is why... With, with very limited exceptions that we'll talk about briefly today, all meetings of a legislative body of a local agency must be open and public. Next. The, um, it, this can really be kind of just easily summarized by saying that the business conducted on behalf of the public is most certainly the public's. They should know what they pay for. They should know what their representatives are doing. And they should know how items are discussed and how deliberations are conducted. So who's subject to the Brown Act? All governing boards of local governments, advisory and standing subcommittees, all boards, committees, and bodies created by federal or state law. Now, you know that the, oftentimes there'll be the creation of an ad hoc committee. An ad hoc committee is not uh, subject to the Brown Act, but it must be only for a very particular purpose. That purpose must be uh, defined well, and when the purpose is achieved, the ad hoc committee must, must dissolve. You cannot have an ongoing ad hoc committee because in, in that case it's a standing committee. So what is a meeting? I, I still hear from various jurisdictions that... Um, well, a meeting is only if action is taken, and that's not at all true. It is no longer 1950 when that might have been true, but now it is a meeting of the majority of the members of a legislative body to hear, discuss, or deliberate on government business. Once that occurs, you have now triggered Brown Act requirements. So what is not a meeting? Is every time if, you, if you're at a store and you see two other board members, do you all have to scatter to points east, south, and west? No. Uh, what is not a meeting? A conference, a training, a seminar, community forums, the meetings of other government bodies, social occasions. Can you all attend the same wedding? Certainly. What you cannot do at any of these uh, events is huddle together 
in three or greater number and discuss county business. Now, with social media particularly and electronic communications, violations of the Brown Act actually uh, can be much easier to inadvertently accomplish. The, um, a majority may not use a telephone, email, fax, internet-based social media platform, or other electronic means or devices, or an intermediate to discuss, develop a consensus agreement or decision. So you have to be careful when you receive emails if someone says, I'd like to do X, and it's sent to all of you. One of the members says, I would like to do X. A second member says, I agree. I think we should do X. Now you have a problem because you're all on the communication. So uh, it is best to avoid those. Now, does that mean emails can't be sent? Of course not. They can be informational emails. Attached here is a white paper from the Department of Justice on X. Uh, you can certainly do that. So it is not, what you have to worry about as a body is to ensure that you're not inadvertently developing a consensus on a matter within your jurisdiction that is outside the open and public meeting. You move the microphone closer. Outside the open and public meeting. Using an intermediary is just as simple as um, one of the supervisors can tell Johanna, I want to do X. And then they say, Johanna, go ask another supervisor about doing X. And Johanna goes to three and comes back and says, well, you've got three. That is absolutely a violation of the Brown Act. Not by Johanna, because she's not a member of a legislative body, but by whichever supervisor center and the ones who inadvertently participate. So the basic notice for a regular meeting is 72 hours in advance, special meeting 24, emergency meeting one hour in advance. Notice always has to be posted in an accessible location and on the local entity's website if you have one. So for example, the 72 hours, if you post it inside a building and the building is closed for 12 hours a day, you can only count the time the building's open. That's why the county posts outside the building, which people have access to 24-7. So the agenda itself has to contain a brief description of every item, which have to be clear enough to be understood by members of the public. And each agenda item for a regular meeting has to include time for public comment on that item, each and every item on the agenda. When I do these trainings to various local bodies, I tell them the agenda is the promise you make to the public. Here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we might take action on. Um, and then keeping within the bounds of that agenda item is how a legislative body keeps that promise to the public. So it is a matter of public trust. And while an agenda item is usually 20 words or less, it has to be enough for the public to understand. You can't just say, we're going to talk about uh, patrol cars. That tells the public nothing. Are you going to purchase them, wash them, drive them? What are you going to do? But you have to be able to alert the public. So again, the public can see, is this worth my time to listen to? Is it worth my time to participate? Now normally you cannot have an action or even a discussion on an item not appearing on the agenda except for public input. As you know, the public is entitled to speak um, on an item that is not before you on the agenda if it's within your subject matter jurisdiction. And because you have a plenary authority where you can, you can adopt a resolution to, to recommend or to support many things, that jurisdiction is relatively broad for purposes of public input. You can, in, in those circumstances, ask a question uh, for clarification, make uh, announcements. You can ask staff to come back with an item for discussion, review, or consideration. Now, obviously, you can take action if there's an emergency or what we call an extra that needs to take a, uh, immediate action, which came to the attention of the board after the agenda was posted, but again, an immediate need. 
Now, the determination of that normally would require a two-thirds vote of the members of, of the body, which is four in this case. However, if less than two-thirds are present, then just a unanimous vote. Now, that's not the case for all matters where your board has to approve certain things by four-fifths vote. But it is when it comes to an extra item. That's why you may recall there have been circumstances where there were only three of you and you took a vote unanimously to approve an extra. And that is well within the bounds of the law. Okay, so the location of meetings, they have to be held within your jurisdiction. There are exceptions. You can go out to inspect real property, personal property. You can meet with federal or state officials. Or you could hold a closed session with your county council. So the rights of the public here are to address the legislative body on both agenda, which is the public comment, and non-agenda, public input items. Unless subject to a closed session exception, um, everything in a meeting of your body has to be open in public. Public is entitled to be accommodated if disabled to ensure access. They're entitled to obtain copies of all written mater uh, materials that are distributed to you, except for privileged materials. And they're able to uh, audio and video record and take photos of proceedings or broadcast them, unless doing so creates a disruption. Closed session, as you know, has to be narrowly construed. The agenda has to contain a brief description of each item. And each item requires a pre-closed session announcement and a post-closed session report. That is why your board reads the items listed on the closed session before you go into closed session. And after you report out if, if and whether there is any action taken. Other than those requirements, the confidentiality of closed session has to be strictly observed. So closed session is personnel matters, labor negotiations, pending litigation, real property negotiations, and the security of public facilities and services. Violations of the Brown Act could lead to invalidation of an agency's action, payment of a challenger's attorney's fees, civil liability, and criminal liability. What I can tell you, however, is the purpose of the Brown Act is not to set up an ambush or a gotcha for legislative bodies. The purpose of the Brown Act is to keep everyone aware that democracy is messy and liberations of, of uh, public issues have to take place in open session so the public can participate, listen, comment, etc. And while I think it must be incredibly difficult for your board to have to engage in all of these deliberations in public, it is still the right of the public to see and hear those Now, telephone uh, conferencing or teleconferencing under the Brown Act, um, I put till the end because it leads me into 2449. Traditional tele teleconferencing under the Brown Act can be used if you meet the requirements of Government Code Section 54953, which means you have to post an agenda at all tele teleconference locations. Each telephone teleconference location has to be identified in the notice and the agenda, and each such location must be accessible to the public. So in that kind of a case, if a board member was traveling and in the course of traveling had to stop over at a Howard Johnson's to, not the plug, but Howard Johnson's to have to sleep and you decided to, and you had given the 72 hour notice of that location, you would have to post it outside your door and if someone came knocking, you'd have to let them in to sit. Hopefully you've arranged a conference room at the motel, but if not, it would be wherever you are. Um, that's why if you're on a cruise, you can't do teleconferencing because obviously there's no way for the public to access it. Um, 361, Assembly Bill 361, until January <coughs> of 2024, authorizes a body to use teleconferencing without compl complying with all of those requirements as far as agenda requirements, notice, and access to the public at that particular location. But it only applies in very specific circumstances, a proclaimed state of emergency where state and local officials or local officials have imposed or recommended measures to promote social distancing, 
uh, hold a uh, meeting during a proclaimed state of emergency for determining by majority a vote, whether as a result of that emergency meeting in person would present imminent risks to the safety of you and the attendees, or the legislative body holds a meeting during a proclaimed state of emergency and determines pursuant to uh, majority vote that as a result of the emergency meeting in person would present imminent risk. Now, Assembly two, Bill 2449, it, it no longer requires uh, you to post notice outside your hotel room or outside a conference room at a hotel uh, or wherever you happen to be when you wish to teleconference as a board member. It no longer requires a state of emergency. However, it is still relatively limiting. It does allow, and this is until January 1 of 2026, members of the legislative body to use telephone conference, teleconferencing without noticing their locations and making them publicly accessible if certain requirements are met. At least a, a quorum of the body has to participate in person at a single physical location. That location is usually your meeting location, which would be here for your board. You have to provide two-way audio-visual platforms or two-way telephone service and a live webcasting of the meeting by which the public may remotely hear and visually observe the meeting and also remotely address the body. You have to give notice of the means for the public to access the meeting and offer public comment. You have to identify an opportunity for all persons to attend via a call-in or internet-based service option. You have to provide an opportunity for the public to address the legislative body and offer comment. Now, it does authorize a member of the legislative body to participate in a meeting remotely only if one of the following circumstances applies. The member notifies the legislative body at the earliest opportunity possible, including just at the start of a regular meeting, of the need to participate remotely for just cause, which has to include a general description of the circumstances related to their need. The provisions cannot be used for more than by a particular member for more than two meetings in a calendar year. So if you have just cause, which is defined specifically in the law, you can only use it twice. Now, the member, a member can also ask the legislative body to allow them part, to participate remotely um, as a result of emergency circumstances. And there again, the body has to is required to request a general description as to why that is necessary. It does not require, obviously, a member to disclose any medical diagnosis or disability or any personal med medical information at all. So you may decide as a body to allow members to participate if the request does not allow sufficient time to place proposed action on such a request on the posted agenda. Uh, but then you take it up at the beginning of the meeting as specified, and the above provisions cannot serve as a means for any member to participate solely by telephone conference for a remote location for a period of more than three consecutive months or 20% of the regular meetings or the local agency within a calendar year or more than two meetings if the legislative body regularly meets fewer than 10 times in a calendar year. And those conditions apply to the emergency Okay, so just cause under 2449 means childcare or caregiving, a contagious illness, or a need related to a physical or mental disability not otherwise accommodated, travel while on official business in uh, or in another state. Emergency is defined as a physical or family medical emergency that prevents a member from attending. So uh, the important thing here to remember about 2449 for any legislative bodies is to provide notice to the board as soon as you're aware of the circumstances, provide a brief description that does not, again, require any member of a legislative body to disclose personal medical information that's not intended to be invasive in that way. And then you just have to keep track of the limitations as to how often each member may use one of those particular exceptions. And finally, Senate Bill 1100, 
Now, presently, as you realize, if there is a disruption in a board meeting, your board may clear the room and wait and then resume action later. What Senate Bill 1100 does is allow the presiding member of the legislative body conducting a meeting or designee to remove or cause the removal of an individual for disrupting the meeting, the individual. Prior to removing an individual, the presiding member or designee shall warn the individual their behavior is disrupting and that failure to cease may result in their removal. If it continues, then you may remove them if they do not promptly cease their behavior. Disrupting for purposes of Senate Bill 1100 means engaging in behavior during a meeting that actually disrupts, disturbs, impedes, or renders infeasible the orderly conduct of a meeting. It could be failure to comply with regulations adopted by the board. It could be engaging in behavior that constitutes a use of force or a true threat of a use of force. Uh, a use of force, a threat, is defined as one that a reasonable observer would perceive as an actual threat. And not a moment too soon, we're at the end. I do think that the changes in the law under 2449 are a positive step. You'll notice it, it has a sunset date, and I think that is because the legislature, frankly, wants to see how it's all going to work. Uh, one of the things I think people came to realize that Zoom and other types of platforms can be very beneficial, particularly for the public to have access from, from locations. Um, and it can also be very helpful for board members because you have many jobs uh, for the county that require travel. And um, that travel sometimes can put you away from the county seat on any given Tuesday board meeting. Purposes. Thank you. Um, anything from the board? Supervisor Green? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the overview, uh, especially of 0.449. So uh, how it relates to our board meetings, uh, certainly one thing, and uh, it does clarify how we can do remote attendance, provided generally we have a quorum in person here. Mm -hmm. uh, it also applies to most of our committees. And uh, my questions are kind of focused on that. We have some committees in uh, transition uh, uh, and their compliance with Brown Act stuff mm -hmm. through no fault of anybody uh, has been spotty just in the time I've been on this board. So um, the general rule that we're gonna be following here in the board chambers, the way I'm reading it, would fall under subdivision E1 of uh, uh, AB 2449. But it, there appears to be in paragraph three of subdivision B, a possibility at least that if a committee wanted to continue basically in all Zoom format, they could do so provided they followed all those agenda requirements. But it's a complicated chunky monkey because all those remote locations would have to be open to the public and would have to have agendas posted. I'm just trying to figure out, depending on the committee, I either have a committee in Scotts Valley that has no internet, and no practical ability to teleconference right now, mm -hmm. or I have some other committees that are so, I don't want to use the word addicted, but they've become accustomed to all Zoom meetings and haven't necessarily fully considered uh, what the transition back to uh, hybrid formats or all in-person formats is going to pose for them. Um, so. Just kind of posing that problem generally, we have a, a wide number of committees, some that are large in nature, some that are distributed around the county, uh, some that do have the ability and prior to COVID did meet in person. Um, so I'm, I'm casting about for guidance that mm -hmm. we can share with the public and also share with our committees about moving ahead, how, how they can comply with this law. Well, as I said, um, um, it's a very good question, and I think it's going to come up multiple times with all of these bodies. Um, the uh, 2449 is not a panacea. It does not make complete sense out of this because it is restrictive by its nature. And so, for example, if you have a five-member advisory body, uh, three of those members are going to have to be in a physical location together. Two of them could be... But again, you have, to, you have to meet the definition of just cause or emergency. So uh, it is not 
convenience and it is not this works better for me there none of those things apply it is rigid in its application to a finding of just cause which the the entity itself is going to have to agree with which oftentimes as things come up it's going to be at the beginning of a meeting uh, but it's not going to allow a hybrid in the same way that hybrids have were done under the governor's executive order certainly and even uh, under a state of emergency it's going to restrict it in the manner I've just described yeah I guess I'm looking for a one-page cheat sheet that I can and I'm happy to all over my I'm happy to prepare one for you Who's first? Supervisor Spatier. I just want to ask Supervisor Green, what section were you looking at? Well, I think uh, all these things, so there is focus on paragraph three of subdivision B. So Paragraph three. I, I, subdivision B, and that seems to imply, and just to confirm I, I'm, with, I'm with not council, on, it are, does are you seem in to section allow. Section one, section two, section three, which section of the bill are you on? Oh, I think, may, may I? I, I think it's if the legislative body of a local agency elects to use teleconferencing, it shall post agendas at all teleconference locations. Is it that one? Yes. All right. But this, this has to do with the traditional method of teleconferencing. Yeah, because I don't think there's anything in here that says that we can continue to be all Zoom. I think there needs to be a quorum or you need to post where the uh, public areas that you will be holding your meeting and teleconferencing from or else... You have to have that quorum, and you can teleconference in through AB 2449, but I don't see anything in here. That's why I wanted to see what you were looking at, because I don't see anything that says we can continue what we've done in the past with other committees. I, as I, well, my, my reading would be different. So at the very bottom of B3, it, it says, for example, could we do all Zoom all the time? Uh, the, body, the last sentence indicates possibly it could if at least a quorum of the members of the body participate from locations within the boundaries of the territory. So again, we would have to have a quorum in territory for the county if we were to go back to all Zoom for the board. If I had, uh, for example, uh, uh, a community in Scotts Valley that all wanted to Zoom in from home as long as they were all Zooming in from home within the geographical area that they represent, I think that, I think the way I'm reading it, that may be possible. It may not be practical, given that they may have to open up those Zoom locations and post agendas and what have you. But it looks to me like there's at least an option for a all Zoom format to continue, provided you follow the uh, slightly more rigorous agenda posting requirements. But it is possible I'm misreading that. I believe that the section you're referring to is addressing the traditional tele teleconferencing and the problem with this is the legislature, I guess, in an effort for legislative economy, um, decided to put all of these things together into 54953. So it becomes, it becomes much more complicated than need be. It also addresses 361, and then it further addresses um, 2449. So if you look at, what I will do is I will provide you uh, with a breakdown of where those sections stop and start so that you can see that and then as I said I'm happy to provide a one-page sheet if you'd like to have that for your advisory bodies um, Yeah, and if that could just be sent to all of the committee chairs um, Susan Yes, we can do that. Okay, that would be great sure. <clears throat> Thanks, okay supervisor Crandall. Yeah, I have uh, just a couple questions um, <clears throat> If there's a document that's brought the day of, I think you stated this, but I want to be just, I want to understand it better. Is like, let's say there's a, we, we, we do have consideration of extra items not appearing on the agenda. And so that would be a way someone could bring someone forward, bring something forward. Huh? And uh, if there's a document brought the day of that I want to read off, it would have to be brought in that section. Um, is that, that's, is that, like, so like, for example, if I want to bring, uh, a proclamation I have to bring the document with and then how do I what do we do to get it to the public on that the, the general rule is that when your board receives a document the public must receive it also okay now um, certain things certain things that may be provided that are uh, 
explanatory, like PowerPoints. You're not going to have those generally until the day of, sometimes in advance. Um, but what, what the law looks at is to attempt to make sure that both your board and the public has these things at least 72 hours. Extras, as you point out, obviously will not. And some presentation material. Uh, but at the time your board receives it, so must the public. And so is reading it sufficient enough, or does the document need to be passed out? Well, it depends upon what it is. If it's a paragraph, reading it is likely sufficient. But, and there are times when your board has quite rightly said, uh, you know, this is a voluminous document and the public hasn't had time to review it. We're going to put it over to give them that time. You've, you've done that on multiple occasions with lengthy documents. So the point of the requirement is to ensure that the public has an opportunity to review and consider whatever is in front of you so their comments have perhaps more significance to them so they understand the issues and can pinpoint exactly what they want to be able to say to a body, uh, but also so that your board can ensure that all of the information for your consideration and discussion is available to you and to the public. All right. My last question is like, in regarding description of the items on the agenda, when, when you create the agenda, it needs to be under 20 words. But with the written exp explanation, and d does it need to be general? Is there any room for like uh, auspicious wording or uh, wording that reflects negatively on the item? Um, it's it's really not meant to be an editorial. It's merely mm -hmm. just meant to be a descriptor. So, for example, if you are going to, if you want to have a discussion. Um, about the Brown Act, and all you're going to do is discuss it. Then you put discussion of Brown Act requirements. And it would be better if you specified which Brown Act requirements you wanted to discuss. But um, it's 20 words is a general rule. It's not really a requirement that you stay under. It can be a little bit over. But it's, it's supposed to be enough so the public can understand, OK, on this item, they're just going to discuss it. But there's no action. So if the public thinks, well, I'll wait until they, this culminates in a vote for some type of action, they may not want to attend. If you put discussion only, then you can't take action. You can direct staff uh, to bring something back to you or to look into something for further review. But you cannot take action as a body. So the description should include discussion and consideration of Proto board protocols to address AB 2449. Now the public knows exactly what you might do and as to what. So they have time to review 2449. They have time to consider the protocols that if the document and the document should be available uh, 72 hours in advance, and they'll have time to review that to see whether they like those protocols. The public oftentimes has very good ideas that your board takes note of and incorporates. Thank you. Supervisor Green. Just, just last question. Um, although everyone's very accustomed to it, under 2449, teleconferencing is entirely optional, right? So for those smaller committees uh, what may have remote internet access issues or just we don't have enough horses to run a Zoom and run a meeting, uh, a, a, a local committee uh, can set its own rules absolutely based on its own needs and abilities a, lo a, a physical presence meeting is always appropriate 2449 simply allows for a hybrid in the manner described okay I'll open it to the public is there anyone in the chambers My name is Robert Stark. I was the general manager of the Cobb Area County Water District yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. and had four boards of directors for 35 years. I would suggest, I would ask if or recommend that this presentation be mailed to every agency as the special district's handbook used to back in the days uh, of old of Cameron Reeves. Uh, 
and that a cover letter by council be on that recommending that this be placed on that e on their next agenda and that agenda be sent back to show that every agency and i realize that's a lot of agencies cemetery districts lighting districts sidewalk districts water districts fire that's a lot of districts i understand that but i have seen repeatedly in my 35 years attempts to oh let's just get it done god do we have to put it on an agenda let's just do it and be done with it and that can't be the way it is so that is just my recommendation thank you thank you robert anyone else in the chambers then we'll go to the zoom room we have betsy Kahn. you can state your name you've got three minutes Thank you, Madam Chair. Betsy Kahn for the Essential Public Information Center. I totally agree with Mr. Stark, of course. And I, uh, this, the Brown Act is probably one of my favorite pieces of legislation, as you can imagine. My work entails attending and uh, concentrating on the actions taken by elected bodies uh, all through the county and in the region and sometimes at the state level. Uh, I will advocate for the use of remote participation capacity building at every opportunity because that is so powerful. It also improves the uh, commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for so many people in the last two and a half years owing to the COVID uh, pandemic. I have saved hundreds of dollars of gasoline and wear and tear my vehicle hours of my time to drive to meetings and then get a, an hour's worth of information, come back and use that to report. So I, I think that's really important. I appreciate every minute of your deliberation. I also so appreciate Ms. Grant. I think she knows how much I have. have yes, <laughs> thank you, Anita. <laughs> uh, over these years, how much I appreciate her. But I do want to say, Anita, when you're swiveling back and forth in your chair, Sometimes your head turns away from the microphone, so pieces of what you're saying are not actually audible. I'll try very hard to listen closely. Thank you so much, everybody. May I respond that normally when I give this presentation, I'm standing. So it's, it's just contrary for an attorney to make a presentation from a seated position, but points well taken, Ms. Khan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have... Julia Bono, got three minutes if you want to state your name. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I would like to get a copy of this presentation and, and uh, perhaps other people would as well. Can you let me know how this will be disseminated to the public? CAO Parker? Yes, we'll place it on Granicus. And also, I was also thinking that we might put it on the committee's web page, but I helped, I'll have to check with IT to see if that's possible. Thank you. And Supervisor Spatier? I know that Sam Houston always does a really good job. Every single time that we have a meeting, he splits off different portions of the meeting so that people can watch three to 10 minutes rather than eight to 10 hours uh, to find those golden nuggets. And so I'm certain that it's possible to maybe work with our CAO uh, to get that specific presentation segregated and uh, easily sent a link to all of the agencies or all of the committees to make sure they have access to that. So I, I think that's possible. Uh, so include a link of this presentation with the, um, with the slides to all of our chairs and committees and agencies. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Houston, for doing that every single week. Okay, anything else from the board? Yeah, I just did like the suggestion the gentleman had uh, a model agenda. Uh, you know, here's where it goes. Here's your findings, 2449. If there is an extra item to be added, there is a thing you do. So having basically a blueprint for them to follow, I think, would be super helpful, uh, not only in Brown Act compliance, but in their own thought process about how, how they're supposed to conduct these meetings. So something of a, of a model agenda would be helpful. That's the board's wish. I'm happy to do. That's fine. Hey, I see three dead. All right. Thank you. Okay, that was the end of 
our timed items. So I am wondering, oh, should we go forward with the mid-year budget? Okay, we will go ahead with item 7.2, 2023, mid-year budget, A, consideration of resolution, amending resolution number 2022-118 to amend the fiscal year 2022-23 adopted budget by adjusting reserves fund balance carryover re revenues and appropriations B consideration of resolution amending resolution 2022-119 to B consideration uh, to amend the position allocations for fiscal year 2022-23 to conform to the mid-year budget adjustments and C consideration of Resolution amending adopted budget for fiscal year 2022-23 to establish fund 74 John T. Klaus Park budget unit 7074 John T. Klaus Park. And I will turn this over to admin. Thank you, board. Um, good afternoon, board. It's going to have to be right in front of your face. Good afternoon, board. <laughs> Uh, Wait a minute, like Hello? Hello? <laughs> Good morning, board. Um, Stephen Carter, Assistant County Administrative Officer. Um, I'm going to actually have the presentation. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Leisha, our new Deputy County Administrative Officer, who is taking over the budgetary um, my old position for budgetary activities. Well, hello, I'm Leisha Phillips. And first of all, I'd like to thank the administrative staff, department heads, and their fiscal staff for their time and effort in completing the review of their budgets. The amount oh, I need to let you know that the amount indicated on the memorandum for this item, um, for the class item, um, was indicated as $2 million, and at the last minute that got changed to $1,960,000, as, as stated in the attached resolution. However, my apologies, this was not updated on the memorandum. Mid-year is a time for all departments to look at their budgets for any adjustments needed to finish out the year. It provides an opportunity to ensure that the department is on track in revenue and expense and will have the necessary resources for the remainder of the year. This year, like most mid-year budgets, has minor changes for your review. I'd like to highlight some of the highlights. Fund 154, the Tech Modernization Reserve, um, is requested to be increased by $1,530,375, utilizing LATCF funds for future accounting system upgrade. We've just placed it there for a place to hold these funds and until your board determines how to utilize these funds. It's not a hard deal. Budget Unit 1674, Flood Corridor Maintenance. Um, the maintenance reserve is requested to be decreased by 380000 due to a delay in grant reimbursement. This is a reversal of a $380,000 increase they did at the, fiscal, the final 22-23 budget. Budget Unit 4014 Behavioral Health is requesting an increase of $85,000 in reserves to facilitate the repayment of the loan from Substance Use Disorder Services. Uh, the total loan repayment is $600,000. Um, also, $998,364 in reserves are being released for the Collier Avenue project. Um, they also received $250,000 for the care court. Budget Unit 4015, Substance Use Disorder Services, is requesting $969,000 and a $68 increase to reserves due to the receipt of that amount in opioid settlement funds. Um, these funds are currently in Budget Unit 1120, and will be transferred to reserves in the Substance Use Disorder Services Budget Unit when their work plan has been developed and approved. Budget Unit 8354, Lake San Southeast. Um, the reserve is requested to be decreased by $40,000 to cover the purchase of a septic collar dump station. And their O&M reserve is, is requested to be decreased by $438,863 to be transferred to their capacity expansion reserve in order to correct that reserve balance. Budget Unit 1012, the Administrative Office, is requesting a transfer of ARPA funds in the amount of $199,750 to fund the Housing and Economic Development staff. 
as um, $2 million of ARPA funds had previously been allocated for housing and economic development. Four positions have been created in the admin office, and this is the estimated 22-23 expense. In Budget Unit 1671, Buildings and Grounds, the request is to accept $62,000 from Sunrise Special Services Foundation to reimburse for utility costs at the warming center at the former juvenile hall. Budget Unit 1785, Public Safety Facilities, has a request to accept $988,600 as a contribution of federal funds um, via Mike, Representative Mike Thompson for the Lakeport Armory Facility Repurposing Project. In Budget Units 2201, 2202, and 2301, which are the Sheriff Corner Central Dispatch and Jail Facilities, they're requesting a transfer of cannabis funds under the Cannabis Policy for Hiring and Retention Incentives as follows. For 2201, $50,000. For 2202, $110,000. For 2301, $325,000. The Sheriff Corner Budget Unit 2201 is additionally requesting $175,000 of cannabis funds for vehicle equipment and installation of that equipment. In the Library Improvements Fund, Budget Unit 6023, there is a request to accept $1,099,667 in California Building Forward Library Infrastructure Grant Program funds and a transfer of $549,835 of general fund for the matching funds. The Treasurer Tax Collector Budget Unit 1122 is requested to reduce their banking fees appropriated of $55,000 and utilize those funds for server license upgrades $30,000 and megabyte sales tax module of $25,000. The Jail Facilities Budget Unit 2301 has requested an additional $43,139 for food and an additional $20,000 for the cell check project. Planning, Budget Unit 2702 is requested to increase their budget by $12,500 for a muni code update utilizing District 4 discretionary funds. The Lampson Field Capital Projects Budget Unit 3123 requested to budget $109,000 from general fund for preliminary engineering for design and environmental work for the hangar project. For staffing, <clears throat> Budget Unit 2201, Sheriff Corner, is requesting the addition of one accounting technician slash accounting technician senior, moving that position from Budget Unit 2301. The addition of one accountant one two, again moving from Budget Unit 2301. And the deletion of four Deputy Sheriff one two positions. Those are the SRO positions. Budget Unit 2301 Jail Facilities is requesting the deletion of one accounting technician slash accounting technician senior, which is being moved to Budget Unit 2201, and the deletion of one accountant one two, again being moved to Budget Unit 2201. Budget Unit 4010 Environmental Health is requesting the addition of one environmental health technician, which is a new classification for them. 4011 Public Health is requesting the addition of one health programs coordinator, the deletion of one nutrition education coordinator, one two registered dietitian, and the increase of the physical therapist from fourth, fifth time to full time. The Behavioral Health Budget Unit 4014 is requesting an additional behavioral health program manager. The Substance Use Disorder Services Budget Unit 4015 is requesting the, de the deletion of one substance abuse programs coordinator, the addition of one staff services analyst, one two, and the elimination of one half time compliance review technician. Social Services Administration Budget Unit 5011 is requesting the deletion of one accounting technician and the addition of one social worker 123. Budget Unit 5164 Housing Administration is requesting to change the Office Assistant allocation to Office Assistant, Office Assistant 3. For capital assets, the Treasurer Tax Collector is requesting to purchase a megabyte sales tax module for $25,000. Public Safety is requesting an additional 988600 which was the funds received from Rep Representative Thompson for the Armory Project. And as previously stated, they're requesting 20000 an increase of 20000 for their cell check program. 
their uh, budget unit 2206 um, is requesting a reduction in their asset of 340,563 to match the funds they had available for that project. The roads department is requesting 17,000 for a printer plotter. Behavioral health is um, requesting um, 130,000 for their South Shore remodel, which were funds received from the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program. Social services is requesting $65,000 for a secure cabinet with tracking system. This is a secure key cabinet with tracking software for storage and tracking of vehicle keys and gas cards, among other items. The Library Improvements Fund, 6023, is requesting to... One million six hundred nineteen thousand nine hundred. This is these are funds that they receive from the California State Library Building Forward Infrastructure Grant. The museums budget unit seventy two one is requesting a large overhead scanner in the amount of seventy thousand um, dollars. This is a very large book scanner for being able to scan the large old books. Watershed Protection District 8109 is requesting an increase in their appropriation for the F-250 crew cab pickup of 12350 for a total of 54350 Lake O'Sand Southeast is requesting the 40000 for the septic hauler dump station. CSA number 21, North Lake Port Water, budget unit 8481, is requesting $20,000 for a land acquisition for pressure zone 2 and $155,000 to upgrade the program mobile logic controller. Kelsey Bell Waterworks District Number 3, budget unit 8593, is requesting $55,000 to replace a three-quarter ton utility truck. Special Districts Administration, budget unit 8695, is requesting a handheld AMR, which is an automatic meter reading reader. Central Garage 9905 is replacing Pool Vehicle TO 146, 47,818. And Heavy Equipment 9908 is requesting a Ford F350 um, pickup increase of 17,100 for a total cost of 59,100. And my last item is the resolution amending adopted budget fiscal year 22-23 to establish fund 74, John T. Klaus Park, budget unit 7074, John T. Klaus Park, in the amount of $1,960,000 um, due to the restricted nature of the funds received. We, they are requesting to increase the revenue count 9201 in the amount of $1,960,000 for private contributions and increase in appropriation to account 2380 professional specialized services at this time for $1,960,000. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the board, your board asked for forecasts, five-year forecasts to be presented. Um, it didn't happen in September because we got too late in the day. I did, um, we did attach two versions of a five-year forecast to the mid-year budget. One that is the all county funds forecast and one that is a general fund forecast. And the key to remember here is that it is just that, it's a forecast with the information we have available. So I would like to start with the all county funds forecast. <clears throat> with, this includes everybody literally all budget units from solid waste to social services to all the general fund departments. There are a lot of unknowns in there, but so if you look at the history, the way we projected forward for the revenues was an increase of 1% and that's mainly for the departments who have discretionary revenue or revenue that fluctuates, not really for the state and federally funded programs that would eventually end up net zero. So the way it, and the ending balance, the ending fund balance, you can see in fiscal year 1718, we had $51,710,000. That includes all reserves as well. So it's not just all 51 million going to fund balance available for next, the next year. It has all the reserves for behavioral health, the reserves, the multi-millions for um, solid waste 
and all the other, and also the multiple reserves for general fund itself. And if the projections hold, the reserves and the ending fund balance would actually keep increasing by about 30 million a year. But what this doesn't take into consideration is we don't know when those reserves are going to be used for a project because you're generally, like in a solid waste instance, you're building it up for a project for like the expansion project. And that once that project goes forward, it's going to make a big hit and go down. So those are the kind of th estimations that we aren't making, those major projects that are going to, going to happen, but we don't know when they are. So this would take the projection as if those don't happen until after fiscal year 26, 27. Now, moving to the general fund forecast, this one is a little easier to estimate because our office is deeply involved with all the budgets. So the way you read this one, the beginning fund balance for like fiscal year 1718 is 11199000 And then all the revenues combined to make a total resources for that year of 57863000 and then the total expenditures actual for that year were 46312000 in change, leaving an ending balance or FBA of 11550000 which is then, that's the beginning fund balance for fiscal year 1819. And before I go any further, the, this one is built slightly different because we know exactly where all the reserves are and in a nice little compiled section below. So... If you were looking at both all county funds versus the general fund, if you were doing apples to apples, the 51 million includes both the 11 million 500 thousand from the general fund forecast and the 14 million that's in reserves. But because we know very well what the reserves are, we broke them out so you just see the standard FBA not including the reserves. As we move forward, fiscal year 22-23 is where the first, we labeled that as estimated because if you put in the budgeted figure, it will look like we spent all of our funds and then there's hardly very little for the next year's beginning balance. But as we all know, it's difficult to spend between 80 and 90% of what's actually budgeted. So this estimated column brings it down to about that ratio of the budget. And during the fiscal year 22, 23, 23, 24, and 24, 25, you'll notice quite a, a large increase in operating expenditures. And then it goes back down for fiscal year 25, 26, 26, 27, down to relatively normal levels. The reason for that is 12 million from ARPA funds and all the other funds that are coming in from grants that we know of within the next three years. It's a large amount and they will, so like the Armory project, at the beginning of the year, it was part of the FBA, the fund balance available, but we have already transferred three million plus over to outside of general fund to 1785 where that project will be completed. That would show as an expenditure here and it would, would not show as FBA for next year. So those are the kind of projects that we know are happening and money is moving and we expect it to come down to normal, t normal expenditures in fiscal year 25-26. But it does look like we have a healthy general fund as well as all county funds. And actually, sorry, one last thing since everybody's quiet. <laughs> The very last line, the general reserves as a percent of resources, that's where during recommended and final budget, um, I use where GFOA, Government Financial Officers of America, the general practice, good practice is about 25%. That's where you see in 1718 it was 12%, and in fiscal year 22-23 we're at 16.7, so we're getting much closer to being able to cover um, the 25%. And the 16% is relatively low, but think about how much revenue we had in that fiscal year. That's an abnormally large revenue year. 
So that's why in fiscal year like 25, 26, even without increasing reserves, it jumps to almost 20%. Supervisor Spatier. Uh, first off, thank you for both of you for taking the time to meet with me and to answer some of my questions. Uh, I, I, I want to ask if you can add something to your presentation, and I'm sorry I didn't ask you about this yesterday, but I think what's important is for us to understand the health of our retail sales tax and our property taxes. How are those going as far as what were our expectations and where we stand? Uh, I'm, going to say that it looks good, but I would prefer it come from somebody with a little bit more expertise than just me. So since I didn't prepare for that, I will say that on the general fund forecast, we are forecasting for both property tax to continue to go up by 2% or 2 to 3% per year. Even with our housing market going down, we are also still catching up on Prop 8s, etc. that will actually make up the difference. Eventually, probably in the next few years, property taxes will, will level off, but I don't foresee it, it taking a downward turn for at least three to four years. And the reason why I say that is even during the recession, if you look at a 20 year history of our property taxes, only one or two years in that 20 years, it actually went down. So even going through mega recessions. But flatten out, absolutely. On sales tax, um, over the last, Three to four years, obviously, it's taken quite a jump. Um, I do expect that it will level off and actually start declining down to where we see our new normal. And I would expect that to happen around 24, 25, 25, 26. But that's what I can do without knowing ahead. I yeah, apologize for not preparing you for that question. I just think it's important because it's the global general fund I don't see either taking a nosedive. But we're meeting expectations of what we estimated based on our budget uh, approved on in September. We are actually above on all counts. And that is actually being taken into consideration in mid-year where all the items that are being requested of general fund, pulling general fund dollars, there is, it's all covered by the known increases in property tax and sales tax that we didn't budget for in September. So it's uh, other than one, which is the library, 549,000 uh, match. That was known in September. We didn't budget at that time because it wasn't f finalized and approved. But at that point in time, um, I stated that it was going to be part of the FBA that we already had. So that's FBA, but all the other increases are, are off of the increases that are already known for property tax and sales tax over budget. So I have a, a few comments that I want to make, and a lot of these I'm looking for consensus from the board. I'm not asking for changes today. I'm asking for things to uh, come back to us over the next uh, few months or at least at the next budget hearings in June uh, for 23-24. Uh, but first, I want to start off with um, right now I know that staff is working on a building and has made great headway already for the economic development and housing. Uh, division and I'm really looking forward to the day where we have a five-year hopefully maybe even a 10-year strategic plan where we can attach some of those plans to uh, what we're projecting coming up in the future to help us understand why there's so much in the fund balance carryover and what is planned to be done with those funds rather than just seeing a number that gets bigger I think it helps understand things and I think it helps to also uh, predict what's the next thing that's going to happen here in Lake County. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think we're taking the right steps to get into that better place. Um, one of the things that I was talking to uh, the team about yesterday that I'm asking for consensus, um, talked about this last time, uh, there was a little bit of a um, subtle but yet direct um, concern raised that if we do get to a, uh, it's probably never going to happen, but if we do get to a place of zero vacancies, uh, zero percent, that we are having to borrow money from places that, in my opinion, are one-time use types of money, like cannabis tax. And so I had asked during the budget that we kind of review where we were with the fiscal crisis management plan before we said to get rid of it because part of the crisis management plan was to reduce position allocations in order to ensure that what raises we provided we would be able to afford 
if we ended up at a 0% vacancy rate. Again, most likely not going to happen, but I would rather we be there than continue to borrow and find ourselves in a place where uh, it would be uncomfortable. So I'd like for us to kind of have that discussion. Uh, I think that would be appropriate for budget um, or any time you feel it's appropriate between now and next budget uh, to kind of review what was the plan then. Is this something we can still uh, put into play to ensure that there's not that three-year uh, prediction that you had stated if we had gotten ourselves to a zero vacancy. I want to make sure that uh, borrowing to continue to provide the services is not, in my opinion, a very solid uh, prediction of the future. We need to make sure that we um, pivot where we need to. Uh, so that's my one that I'm looking for consensus that we have that conversation. I believe we had consensus on that during the budget to have it for mid-year. Uh, I'm willing to continue the conversation and, and place it later, uh, but just asking the board again. Um, would you just want to do zero or do you want to look at different thresholds, like if we get to a 5% vacancy? I'm just looking at where we are, where we're heading. and Yeah, let's do multiple thresholds. Yeah. I'll do zero, but I, it, within that, it's once you have that number, it's fairly simple to yeah. do. Yeah, so zero, five, ten. Because ten is unfortunately realistic. Twenty right. is actual. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Okay. Uh, my next one is um, I'd like to request, because I don't see it in here. It was something that I brought up during our budget. So we're having the regional county park and rec district conversation. Um, and right now there is money being accumulated by some of our partner jurisdictions, uh, but we have zero dollars accumulated thus far uh, to come to the table. And um, my personal opinion is if I'm going to create a partnership and I see a partner coming to the table with zero dollars, I don't know if I want to partner with that partner. And so I want to make sure that we're showing we're serious. And so I'm hoping that in June you can find a million dollars to set aside to show that we're serious, that we do want to take part in this and continue that conversation with something behind us rather than just continue the conversation with words. Uh, and that's something that I'm hoping that we can find and make possible by June. And I know that we can do that and looking again for consensus to see if we could put that on. Is it possible to get consensus? Because that did come up in September mm -hmm. and wasn't sure. I, I had a question mark next to that, whether the board actually wanted to try to do that. So yes. OK. Um, next is, um, I'll, I'll get back to that one. That one's the most difficult. Um, I'm also hoping that sometime in the near future we can have, and I don't know if it'll be the auditor controller, or I know that Ms. Phillips was working on this when she was at the auditor controller's office, but kind of a breakdown of our disaster relief fund. Uh, there's some that's reserved. There's some that's supposed to be paid back to our departments. There's some that's being held just in case the state or the feds want their money back because Either we weren't supposed to get the money or we didn't do everything exactly, cross our T's and dot our I's like they expect everything to happen. Uh, but I'd like to get an idea because it's a large number um, and it's kind of difficult to maneuver through there. Uh, and also what's there to prepare us for the next disaster as well. Uh, and just hoping that we can have that discussion to kind of break that down because uh, we want to be prepared and we, it's, it's a large number and I think it's good to explain that to the public as well. And again, looking for consensus. Yeah. I would have, I would, I will talk with um, the auditor controller, Genevieve Harrington, because that would be perfect for her June recommended budget when she's explaining her budget units. Do a full review of, of 1920. Okay. Um, and then two things. So one I've already kind of uh, discussed, but uh, I'm hoping that in a future agenda item, we can really talk about the opioid settlement, all the entirety of it, not just what we've received, because uh, I think we need a long-term plan. Uh, and then also the LATCF, which I'm sorry, local agency, tribal... Consistency fund. fund. It's just the name of the fund. Yes. And um, so I, I'd like to sit down. It's about $3 million, I believe, that we're going to receive. Uh, half of it in May. We've already received half of that. Uh, and I know that right now it's not dedicated, but it's been placed under tech modernization. I don't disagree that we need to modernize some of our software that we're using. But at the same time, I'd like to have the, the bigger conversation about what is our priority for the, the entirety of the $3 million. And so hoping that we can do that, too. And that was actually the intent. It was not to change the color from LATCF funding. 
to tech modernization. It just eventually it's hard to track all the FBA numbers, 12 million ARPA, 1.5 here. It puts it in a reserve ready for when the board has a specific project or idea for that funding, then we pull it down and either replace the funds in there with general fund or just pull it down and use it because we have to claim that funding. So it's, once it's used, we have to claim it, so it needs to be tracked carefully. And, and then my last one, um, again, needs consensus because I think this is kind of a somewhat large undertaking. Um, but I'm looking at the list of capital projects, capital improvements, and I'd like to under, better understand what is the equity of our spending of large dollars, because it gets pretty blurry in the gritty details, of what districts are we putting funds into, and is it done in an equitable way, and is there a plan maybe for long-term equity rather than on an annual basis equity, but I, it's hard for me to know and understand um, the equity of our capital improvements and services uh, when compared from township to township, or district to district. So I think district would probably be the easiest. Uh, and I'm looking at large things only, not nitty gritty. I don't need to know, is code enforcement more focused on this and that? I think that gets difficult. Same thing with the sheriff's office. Uh, but with the capital improvements, roads, things like that, I think it would be important for all of us to understand uh, where the majority of it is going and is it done equitably. Well, in the need basis, because you're looking at capital projects where there's significant need and there, you know, it's been years of um, putting things off, so that has to be part of it too. No, I think there's so many more yeah. things that could be a part of it. I mean, we could look at population demographics as well, but I, I, I think start simple, and, and it doesn't need, mean that it's going to guide us, but it's going to help us better understand things. Um, and it's something I've been looking into and, and trying to figure out on my own and thought I'd ask for consensus to see if that's something that staff could come back with. Again, no set date. That one uh, will be difficult but doable. I think that's a long-term win for them to work on. I, I'm not sure. It, I, can you do that in by June? Because there's so many variables. I have to say yes. <laughs> and and I, I don't have a set date. I, I just think it'd be something that would help us in guiding how it is that we choose to spend some of these because large Because when every, the, the next fiscal year's budgets are um, submitted to admin, either the end of the first week of April or second week of April, I'm, I'm not sure. At that point, all the capital assets are known. I'm just not necessarily going to know which district they're in, so we can have conversations with the departments to try to determine which districts they're in and and see how how it's going to look. Don't know yet. Okay. I, I think there would have to be some scoring, too, with, you know, the shape of the capital project and the need and how long the work has been delayed. I'm not prepared to move forward with that request at this time, so no. Okay. Well, that's one. You're asking for by the June or by September? I no no date. Just uh, I, I think it's a difficult one to come up with, and I think it's going to take time. So I don't want to set a specific date. If it's possible by the end of the year, that would be great. Uh, that way, we're prepared in mid-year budget again next time. But uh, it's something that I think eventually is needed for us to better understand where we're placing these dollars. I hate to say it, but I would prefer a date so that there's a timeline and it doesn't get to the bottom of the pile. Final budget, September. I'm okay with that. Well, can I just dive in because I'm not sure what I'm consensusing to or not, just because I'm the new kid on the block. So if I can just confess a little bit of confusion and maybe follow up with what you're asking for. Um, and I know this is just very bare bones forecasting here. This is not the full blown budget, but is uh, slightly different from what I encountered with the city. So. Uh, to the question of the parks and rec set aside, that fall, sounds like a capital reserves question. And I think there was a question about capital needs assessment. So I'm not seeing a, uh, what in my mind in this breakout is a, uh, a f uh, basically a full line item or several line items related to our capital planning or capital reserves and uh, to the point raised about capital needs. Um, so on the park and rec set aside of a million, 
if, if I had a better handle of where that particular project was going in terms of capital needs, uh, or whether the dollars might be expended for pre-planning and stuff like that, that that weren't capital in nature, you know, that'd be okay. But the set aside to me, if it were to happen at all, would go into a capital reserve fund. Um, that is what he means. It would be a parks reserve. Do we break out capital reserve separately, though? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then to the question on the uh, opioid settlement, we park that money in a tech modernization fund? Not no. in the SUDS um, budget right now in their reserves. So the opioid is was currently deposited in budget unit 1120, which is the depository for all general fund that doesn't have a specific budget unit attached. And mid-year is transferring it to budget unit 4015, SUDS. And then once it re lands in SUDS, it's going to reserve there, specifically for opioid activities, which the board would have to approve to um, remove it from the reserves for usage once there's plans. The LATCF funds of a little over 1.5 million, that's the funds that we are putting into the tech modernization reserve. And it's gonna be tracked the whole time because it has to be claimed. And once the board has decided what we want to, you guys want to use those funds for, we'll pull it down and utilize it. Or if, since we need to do a new accounting system within the next three to five years, use it for that, it would stay. Otherwise, when the board has a project, we remove it and put it towards that project. And then lastly, to the last ask, I, I think it was generally you were requesting a, a better roadmap of where we're at with our capital projects. Um, I don't know exactly what you were asking for. Capital assets by district. Yeah, yeah, I support that. So it looks like there's a consensus for that for September 20-something, whenever the final budget is. Um, not hard on that. If you have to wait till next year, I'm I'm good with that. How about I will give every we will give every effort to make it for September. Thank you, Supervisor Green. Sorry, pen down. Okay. <laughs> um, any other board comments, uh, Supervisor Crandall? Yeah. So um, in regard to budget 2202, I know we talked about it briefly yesterday. I um, would like to, uh, I know it's about reimbursements for approval to ensure current fill-ins or deputies so they could be accommodated for in filling these positions. It's a dispatch. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know we also talked about the hiring bonuses and things of that nature. And so, you know, in, in preparing for um, an anticipation of those positions being filled, can we ensure some of these? Uh, I know this is backfilling for 2021 20, 22, but I want to ensure that, the, that it's maintained or if there's another discussion that needs to take place to ensure that uh, we can provide that uh, benefit to that department so that that way we don't have to utilize deputies anymore. Is that a discussion we have to have, like in general, like this, or can we have it at the next budget time frame? That can happen in June. The reason why is this. Mid-year is moving 50,000, I believe it is. I think it's 100. 110,000 for the hiring and retention bonuses. I purposely had um, Mary Beth bring enough hiring bonuses over for what is actually projected through the end of June, which is what happened for hiring new employees. Um, and that is always part of the budget for budget unit 1064 cannabis to have a section just for hiring bonuses and retention bonuses. Mm -hmm. So it, it is naturally there and available. It just needs to be utilized. Okay. And then, um, so thank you for that. Um, and I apologize, Sheriff Howe, if I'm talking about your stuff. But uh, <laughs> another one is uh, 2301 jail facilities. Um, and this one is a little more, um, it's just trying to see if uh, with the funding intact or um, preparing for specific funding, um, Sorry, my, I was trying to put my, push my screen up, and it's not a push screen. Um, for benefits, does this need to be negotiated between union reps and admin, uh, or can it be another discussion uh, presented for mid-year in June? Um, 
benefits meaning like uh, like know, their eighty twenty benefit they have? Is it for like health benefits, things of that nature? I don't think the jail facility has. They don't have that. Mm -mm. That would be during negotiations. Is that the same as corrections or? Yeah. Okay. That would is, be that, is that something that has to be determined between the? Uh, the uh, it would be negotiations. Okay. Yeah, just so making sure. In, in the determination out of that, when you sign an MOU or a, a side letter, then it goes into budget. Okay. Just wanted to um, yeah, see if that can be something to look at. That's it. Is that it? Well, as I mentioned, um, during our governance meeting, we're going to have to allocate a significant amount of funding for hazard tree removal with the um, OES application once that's completed. And so I just, I need everybody on board with that um, because we are gonna have a 25% match and we're looking at many millions of dollars and we're, we're looking at other places, <laughs> but um, ultimately this ball is rolling and once that application goes through and we start doing that work, we're gonna have to um, use that funding and just wondering what your recommendation is for that, Stephen. Could we use AB 297? <laughs> <laughs> so there are multiple possible funding sources. Currently, um, there is about 1.2 million available in cannabis funds that would be able to fund it for a little while. But with the ongoing revenue for next year, it would probably be about 1.5 available. It would have to be fund balance available or cannabis at recommended and final budget time. And that's gonna be a large amount, potentially in between one and five million. So that would, there's no one location I can find that. Okay. And just for the board's awareness, um, our CD is working on a CAL FIRE grant to take care of some of this work, but that, um, that award would be likely uh, midsummer and not funded until fall. And then um, we're also working with Congressman Thompson's office for federal funding options. But all of those are really far out and so they will augment this and, and um, this work, but we have to get the work started and so we're gonna need that funding. And with last week's, uh, as you all know, I've been working with um, Senator McGuire's office since last May to try and get the 25% match that CAL FIRE did provide. And then we were told no in January, but last week the U.S. Forest Service aerial report was released and showed that um, tree mortality is incredibly widespread across all of California. And so I do suspect that the state is going to have to take another look at this because the counties that were impacted before and the counties that received that 25% match are back in the same boat. And although we were the first county to declare this emergency last May um, and Napa and Mendocino have followed, I think we're gonna see a lot of counties now that the data is out there. And I know that um, Supervisor Crandall was doing that work for us in DC last week. So. But all of these things that we're doing, um, you know, it, there's still a lot of work to do and it's gonna cost us a lot of money. Supervisor Crandall? Yeah, just, I didn't explain why I asked about those budget items and I'm just trying to give the table legs basically to um, get some of our deputies on the, you know, on the streets rather than having to deal with the, these, these uh, backfills of the position. So that's, that was my, that's my uh, trajectory, if you will, so. Supervisor Spatier. Yeah, I just wanna, um, on the uh, tree mortality thing, I know in May we do plan on getting another 1.5 million, and I don't know if there's any anticipation for that to be kind of uh, scheduled for an, a specific purpose, but I would say that that's an opportunity there as well to yes. help uh, with the two point, the 25 talking about cannabis? Talking about cannabis? The LATCF, oh, okay. the uh, second payment. All three theoretically can be used for that. Yeah. Right, they're all, yep. Okay, anything else from the board? Open it to the public. Anyone in the chambers? Come up to the podium and state your name and you'll have three minutes. Uh, good morning, my name is Greg Holmes. 
And I have a letter here I'd like to submit to all of the board members. If uh, anyone could hand it to them. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, an issue from the ranch fire of 2018. Uh, I own property out past Upper Lake, and in that fire, uh, as it moved through our property, it destroyed all the structures on it. And uh, it's taken quite a while to lever up the funds to rebuild the infrastructure, which finally I've just gotten done. In going to the building department to get a permit to restore the power temporarily in order to test the system, the well and the power system. They're refusing to issue a temporary permit because they say they have no record of any inspections that were ever done on this property. So apparently they've either lost my file or expunged my file of something like $400,000 worth of structures that I build out there. All I'm asking for is for you to uh, persuade the building department to give me a permit to temporarily uh, heat up the power so that I can test the well and prove that all those things work to a potential buyer. Okay, is this I'm, I'm sorry, is this regarding our budget conversation that we're having right now? I'm sorry, then apparently I didn't hear you correctly. I, I, I was presenting a, oh. a personal request. So we do public input at 9.06. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see anyone in the chambers and I don't see anybody in the Zoom room. So I can, we can bring this back to the board for action. Just a quick clarifying question. Sure. The uh, Part C for John T. Klaus, this is to approve the uh, receiving of the funds, the 1.96, and do we need to say as amended, or has it already been amended it's, on there? The resolution's already amended. Okay. The reason for the resolution is this fund and budget unit don't exist yet. So the resolution is creating the fund and resolution, as well as at the same time appropriating the revenue Okay. Operations. Perfect. Thank you. Madam Chair, if you're ready, I offer the resolution amending resolution number 2022-118 to amend fiscal year 22-23 adopted budget by adjusting reserves, fund balance, carryover, revenues, and appropriations. The resolution has been offered. Can we roll okay. call, please? Yeah. Supervisor Simon. Aye. Supervisor Sabatier. Aye. Supervisor Crandall. Yes. Supervisor Green. Aye. And Supervisor Paiska. Yes. Thanks. Madam Chair, I offer the resolution amending resolution 2022-119 to amend the position allocations for fiscal year 2022-23 to conform to the mid-year budget adjustments. Yeah, the resolution has been offered. Roll call. All right. Supervisor Simon. Aye. Supervisor Sabatier. Aye. Supervisor Crandall. Yes. Supervisor Green. Aye. And Supervisor Paiska. Yes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So I would like to offer the resolution for, let me read it properly. To adopt resolution amending an adopted budget for fiscal year 22 and 23 to establish fund 74 John T. Klaus Park, budget unit 7074 John T. Klaus Park. All right. Supervisor Simon. Aye. Supervisor Swatier. Aye. Supervisor Crandall. Yes. Supervisor Green. Aye. And Supervisor Paiska. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Court. Thank you both. Thank you. We and we will take a five minute break <laughs> and we will rejoin at 1055. <laughs> okay, so we are back and we will start with item 7.3, overview and discussion of the organizational analysis of indigent uh, services report entitled The Right to Counsel in Lake County, California. And this is by admin, CAO Great. Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. The county contracted with the Sixth Amendment Center to analyze the provision of indigent services, also known as public defender services. Beginning in September 2021, the Sixth Amendment Center observed approximately 170 court proceedings and interviewed several different stakeholders. 
Since the 109th page report is available <laughs> online, I plan to briefly share the consultant findings and recommendations. The board item 7.4 following will present the initial steps staff recommends as next steps. Please note, the findings and recommendations do not, I mean, I'm sorry, let me start again. The findings and recommendations are that of the Sixth Amendment Center. So under findings, there were four findings. The first is that, just as an overview, the state of California has not established any means to ensure that Lake County provides to every indigent defendant an attorney who has the time, training, and resources to provide effective presentation presentation at every critical state of a criminal or juvenile delinquency case. Uh, in short words, or in short terms, it's, it's an unfunded mandate by the state of California. The second finding is that although the contract provides a means by which the county can oversee the partnerships administration <coughs> and provision of the right to counsel, Lake County does not do so. The county does not know on an ongoing basis whether the right to counsel, if being provided effectively to how many and in how many cases of what types, by whom, and how much the provision of the effective right to counsel should cost. Um, that's, in my opinion, um, a failure to manage the contract which falls within the, the field of the administration. Uh, third finding, the LID partner attorneys subcontract with private attorneys, including themselves, to represent indigent defendants in the types of trial level cases for which the state of California is responsible for providing the right to counsel under the U.S. Constitution. Although the subcontracts provide means by which the LID partner attorneys can oversee the provision of the right to counsel by all the subcontractor attorneys, they do not know on an ongoing basis whether the right to counsel is being, effective, is being provided effectively. I want to go back to item two for a moment. When I said it was a failure on admin's part, it's a failure of capacity and knowledge in order to manage that type of contract. Finding four. Lake County's contract with the lead partner attorney pays them a flat annual fee to administer the trial lever indigent defense system and to provide all right to counsel services for which the state of California is responsible under the U.S. Constitution. These flat fee compensation methods result in a system-wide conflict of interest between each and every indigent person's interest in their constitutionally guaranteed right to effective representation and the personal financial interests of the attorney appointed to represent them, leading to the constructive denial of the right to counsel to some indigent people in Lake County. Again, I want to reiterate that this, these are the um, findings by the Sixth Amendment Center. <coughs> The report also included the following recommendations. Lake County policymakers should advocate for the state of California to form a legislative and or a gubernatorial committee to study and make recommendations about how best to fulfill the state's sixth and 14th amendment responsibilities. Recommendation two, the Lake Board of Supervisors should establish a nonpartisan independent commission to oversee all aspects of indigent representation services. And lastly, Lake County Board of Supervisors should establish, immediately establish an office of indigent representation services to carry out the day-to-day -day duties of the commission headed by an executive director attorney selected by the commission. So in conclusion, the evaluation cites a lack of accountability and oversight in Lake County's provision of public defender services. Administration and County Council have been exploring the next steps that would best fit the County of Lake, both structurally and financially, to provide effective public defender services. This concludes my overview. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anything from the board? Do we have anybody from the public in the chambers? Good morning. My name is Andrea Sullivan. I am a co-administrator of uh, Lake Indivision Defense, also known as LID. This is my partner, Tom Feimer, and together we administer Lake Indigent Defense, which uh, 
administers public defense in Lake County. We have had the contract. I have been the original partner since 2017. Um, there's been a couple of other partners that have uh, assisted and then went on to other things. One became a judge and another has recently retired. Since 2017, we have not gone off of con uh, the contract at all and we have done that ethically and legally. We uh, represent over 95% of the defendants in Lake County. And we do that at a budget that is well than less than half than comparable counties. Um, so some highlights that uh, from the report, uh, the report says that two felony uh, defenders have no previous criminal experience. That's blatantly not true. All of our defenders on the felony contract are experienced in criminal law. They may be referencing two former district attorneys that came to work as uh, felony defenders. I also take issue with the idea that a flat fee uh, creates a system-wide denial of the right to counsel. A flat fee by another name would be a salary. Um, so uh, I'll let uh, Mr. Feimer uh, discuss some of the possible options that the board could take. <coughs> Thank you, Andrea. Let me restart your three minutes. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate this opportunity. Just to follow up uh, what uh, my partner, Ms. Sullivan, and co-administrator said, uh, yes, the um, flat fee uh, finding is a bit puzzling. Uh, the report also, uh, 6AC, as if you look at their other findings in other places around the country, usually does is recommends a statutory public defender office wherein everybody would be working for a fixed salary. Uh, it is true that uh, our contractors are effectively carrying the load of a uh, full-time public defender, uh, and we are not paying them as much as somebody doing comparable work in another county. The reason uh, we justify that system is defenders are allowed to take uh, other clients, private clients, clients out of county. Uh, again, in, if uh, this is creating a conflict, uh, frankly, we're going to need to look at some form of greater compensation uh, in order to basically just retain people. Uh, right now, we are forming, I take issue with the idea uh, that we're not denying people the right to counsel. I can say we are guaranteeing everybody who needs a lawyer Council, uh, council. If you look at the numbers in the six AC report, although they don't do much analysis, council that is providing outcomes that is as good or better than many of the statutory offices within the state of California. Uh, but we're doing it at uh, bare minimum of staffing levels of attorneys, uh, and the reason is because again, uh, the pay is not kept pace with. Uh, inflation and also uh, what uh, comparable other counties are offering. We just had a very uh, talented, a very, uh, very uh, good attorney leave us for Mendocino County in their public defender office simply because they offer what we cannot, which is a higher salary and benefits. Um, Nonetheless, uh, our attorneys are under what are challenging circumstances are doing a phenomenal job. I, while I welcome more oversight from the board, I think the counties and you know should and can expect that. Uh, I do take issue with some of the ideas of establishing another office or some other thing to sort of direct, you know, attorney performance. Uh, fundamentally, our people know their jobs. Uh, they know how to defend people, and they do it well. I, I think adding more and more layers of, uh, you know, officers or other administrative staff isn't going to get anybody out of jail sooner who shouldn't be. Uh, isn't going to uh, get anybody uh, a shorter sentence if they're deserving it. What we need are. Uh, more attorneys and more resources for those attorneys. Thank you. Thank you. And we can uh, answer any of the board's questions. If okay. Thank you. Let me check the Zoom room. Is there anyone else in the chambers? 
I don't see any hands up in the Zoom room. Bring it back to the board. Supervisor Sabatier. And I don't know which uh, item this belongs in, but I think it kind of both <coughs> items offer the same opportunities for some of the comments I want to make. But the impacts to someone's life if um, we are not overseeing or ensuring that all appropriate services are provided, uh, the impacts of going to jail, the impacts of being arrested, the impacts, um, the impacts are very real uh, and can be not just a setback, but can also uh, close a lot of doors. So I think this is an important topic for us to lean and move forward with. Um, but we need to set up a system that will not just be people who care, but people who understand the system in, in, in a legal way. Uh, and we need to, uh, I think, act expeditiously and, and make every attempt we can to make sure that we are uh, crossing our T's and dotting our I's and ensuring uh, that the people that we represent here uh, are provided the appropriate services. Um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, uh, but I do know that a lot of people in our community have interactions with the justice system um, and ensuring that that interaction is uh, the appropriate process that they go through is, I think, of utmost importance for all of us. Supervisor Green. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see this item. Uh, unlike the next one, does have a recommended action, and that would be to direct staff to develop and implement a plan to improve public defender services. That's going to be as close to a no-brainer recommended action as I've seen uh, in my lifetime. Uh, without any disrespect to any individual cases, any individual attorneys, any individual outcomes, uh, I do personally uh, see a need for increased oversight and understanding and by the way, not just uh, for indigent counsel, uh, I'm concerned about performance uh, of our DA's office from time to time. I note in the staff report that the county is one uh, party that has responsibilities. The state of California probably has the greater share in my estimation, and therefore I think the judicial counsel and our bench also have an affirmative duty to make sure that all the wheels are on our justice system and moving appropriately. Um, I can't claim to be an expert on this court, uh, but in my previous incarnation at DSS, I did have the ability to watch a fair number of juvenile dependency proceedings. I also uh, tended to watch the Friday trial assignment calendars, uh, and I'm just a lay person. Uh, but uh, in both settings, it has been bumpy sometimes. Uh, it has been uneven. and. And the saying that justice delayed is justice denied springs to mind. Um, when you're dealing with contract attorneys, whether it's for juvenile dependency or indigent defense, uh, and those attorneys have obligations often in different counties, um, it, you know, how would we even begin to uh, do over adequate oversight of that? You know, when we have basically a herd of cats with law degrees um, and crowded court calendars and a growing number of specialty courts, and now this uh, indication that we're going to move toward care court for seriously mentally ill uh, people in the near future. And that will implicate indigent defense as well. So. Um, I, I'm just strongly supportive of that. I was very concerned to read the report. Uh, I know it was just focused on Lake County. I have to imagine there are plenty of other rural counties in similar uh, uh, situations. Uh, and I don't know that immediately adopting a public defender model is where we need to go. But, but I, do, I do agree very strongly with the report's primary recommendation that we need added oversight over indigent defense. Thank you. Anyone else? Supervisor Spatier. Well, for direction, I think that I'd like to see something come back to us as to what that uh, oversight looks like and who are the uh, members of that oversight uh, committee. 
I know we have something right now, but I think we need to revamp and re review uh, and possibly renew um, just to make sure, and that's not the subject today, so I don't want to get into the details, but I, I definitely hope that that will come back to us ASAP so that we can start putting out applications, reaching out to uh, specific individuals that we know meet the qualifications, but I think that's uh, a good step in, in moving forward at first. Um, and I think that we, 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 we do need to look at what is the next uh, iteration, because I don't think as it's been working, uh, no one from LID has approached us saying it's not working. Um, unfortunately, we, we paid for these uh, comments that were made, uh, these recommendations that uh, were read out loud from the uh, Sixth Amendment uh, group. Um, but that is their findings, and I don't think their findings are too far off of uh, what, what is happening. And so I think we need to do a change, and we need to figure out what that change looks like. But I think first and foremost, bring back to us um, that committee. So will we, do we have consensus to direct staff to implement the plan? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And we will move on to... Item 7.4, presentation of initial steps in the county's ongoing review of the provision of legal services for indigent criminal defendants, county council. Thank you, board. I'll be presenting this along with Carlos Torres, a deputy in my office, who's also sitting as your advisor today. Um, I'd like to begin by just stating that uh, in the report that was proffered of 109 pages, criticism is always so much yeah, easier. Move closer. Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. That in the report uh, that has just been referenced of 100 plus pages, uh, you'll notice that there were barely three pages given to recommendations. Criticism is easy. Uh, constructing improvements is much more difficult. Um, the criminal justice system in California across the country uh, can often be chaotic just by nature of the work that's performed. What we're talking about today are things that we believe um, can improve the system and the provision of legal services that, that uh, our office has been looking at. And one of the things that um, has been discussed briefly is the oversight. And the county has had a public defender advisory committee. Uh, we believe the committee uh, could be much more robust with people who are actually affected by the criminal justice system, who have been a defendant in the in the criminal justice system, who by nature of their classifications are often mishandled through the criminal justice system. People who can provide your board and the public with a great deal more information as to what criminal justice actually means in a real and practical way. Uh, that will also help you understand the challenges and the hurdles that have to be overcome in this process. Um, one of the other uh, recommendations that we'd ask you to consider is to develop a community-based approach to criminal defense services. Supervisor Green was talking about all these specialty courts. Uh, those courts exist for a reason, and working in conjunction with those courts may develop a, a great deal of community-oriented approach. Not everyone uh, who's committed a crime belongs in a jail cell. The um, item number three in our presentation uh, is to retain the services of a former public defender to assist the county in ensuring the comprehensive provision of indigent services. Not a um, high optic review, but an actual uh, on the grounds, roll up the sleeves kind of assist in this, in this program by someone who is the person we have in mind, and I'll let uh, Carlos Torres explain that to you in more detail. The person we have in mind is a retired public defender of some significant stature who 
is well known throughout the state and one of the most dynamic people I've ever spoken to. Um, and then to continue to pursue grant funding um, in terms of improvements to the services, both computer access, uh, office work, et cetera. There are so many things that could be improved if we have grant funding. I know that the admin office uh, and members of my office worked together to submit a recent grant, and Carlos can also explain to you the particulars of that. So that, in a nutshell, are the recommendations that we're making. And uh, again, none of this will happen overnight, but a steady progression along these lines will both provide your board with more information as to the nature of the services and where things may need an assist from the county, both uh, in terms of resources and staffing. But it will also, I believe, help to drive a more community-based approach toward public defender services as a whole. And with that, I'll let Carlos go ahead and... Hello, board. Um, so several months ago, uh, this body had tasked our office, as well as admin, to consider things that we could do to both support and improve uh, the services provided by, uh, by LID and, and whatever we could do, maybe even outside of LID, um, to help our, our indigent defendants. One of the things that we've been doing from the beginning was reaching out to both active chief public defenders and recently retired chief public defenders because no one else would have the, the sheer amount of knowledge as, as people in those positions. And we've been lucky in that every single one of them that we've contacted has been readily available to help. They have suggestions and they want to be part of it. They want to help Lake County do better. And now with the publication of this report, they have all seen it. It has made the rounds through the public defense world very, very quickly. And so the, the, the public defender most recently that we've been talking to the most, who has been the most helpful, uh, his name is Jose Varela. He's the retired chief public defender of Marin County. Uh, he was in that position for 16 years. Uh, he currently runs trainings. He uh, He's somebody who is involved in public defense from top to bottom. And he is willing to, under a uh, service agreement, assist us in all the changes that are necessary, at this point necessary, uh, to improve the level of services for our indigent defendants. Um, he's been an incredible help. And at some point, I would, uh, I would love for the board to be able to talk to him and and, and ask of him questions because honestly we from this office we don't always know what we don't know we're county council we handle civil issues all day long but criminal is a different animal and so we only know so much it's important that we ask someone who does um, aside from that uh, we've been in touch with the uh, the california office uh, the state Public Defender's Office for California. Uh, they've been incredibly helpful in not only helping find new grant opportunities, of which we've recently uh, applied for a, a third one. Uh, all three of our grants combined um, would total over 1.3 million, which is what we're really looking to do is help boost the amount of money that we can use as resources for this, for this project. Um, but also in putting us in contact with other public defenders, both chiefs, high deputies, people who are involved, professors, everybody who has a stake in this process. Um, and it's been, it's been really great. Uh, so, so currently, we're in negotiations with that retired chief public defender to offer his services on a more continued basis. Uh, we're continually having conversations with the state we're continually looking at, at new opportunities for new funding. And ideally, we want to work with our partners in LID because we understand the attorneys that work for them now, they're going to be our partners going forward. Right? These are going to be the attorneys that are still going to represent Lake County. We want to support them. We want to help them do the best that they possibly can. So we're willing to work with them and, and see what they need and offer the resources that we can. 
so that another report like this would never be warranted again. No one wants to see their county described like, like ours was. Right? Um, it, it's not a surprise. Every report that 6AC does has similar outcomes. But that makes sense because counties don't ask for a consultant to look at programs that are doing great. You wouldn't need to. I mean, there's a reason we, we commissioned it. There's a reason they had the findings that they did. But because of that, we're all moving in the right direction to help fix it. So if you have any questions about our, our direction, I'd be more than happy to answer it. Supervisor Green. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Strongly supportive of all the uh, proposed ideas in here. Uh, but again, going back to the idea of shared responsibility, our, our county as a whole, admin, has a role in that. We, we pay for things. Uh, the state has a bigger role, I would say. They build courtrooms that have been waiting for a while. Would love to see another judge. Um, so I want to support this, but as we support this, you know, and as we focus on the public defender role, again, I want to reinforce something I said earlier. You know, it is what happens in those bumpy courtrooms is, is very much a shared responsibility. So it doesn't fall on lid in any way uh, when we have caseloads or stuff getting juggled by the DA's office um, that lands in their lap and they, they are trying to juggle those assorted balls. It doesn't fall on lid in any way when we don't have enough judges or when we have visiting judges. Uh, it's not on lid to figure out whether a Zoom court is still as useful as it was in years past. Um, the, the cadence of our court proceedings and the various requirements, again, of our specialty courts, um, I can't imagine how any attorney, however well prepared they might be, would be able to follow all these bouncing balls and, and uh, get a glowing report from 6AC or anyone else. So I want to be supportive. Uh, one question I would have for Lid is if they have adequate uh, funding for investigator services now. Um, you know. Uh, if they're just showing up with one shoe in the courtroom and, uh, you know, uh, not able to meaningfully uh, present their cases because they don't have adequate resources or they're waiting on witnesses or something like that. So one initial question I would have is, uh, in addition to the contract attorneys we have under LID, what, what type of support do they have right now? Um, uh, again, just a very lay observation of what I saw, but I uh, saw too many Marsden hearings going on. Uh, you know, saw judges getting DQ'd and stuff like that. So part of that is the normal give and take of criminal justice. And, uh, but part of that seems a little bit above the norm, uh, even in a small rural county. So uh, as much as I want to get this stuff going, I do want to be supportive of LID in the meantime. And if there are any short-term needs um, that we can add to this bullet list, uh, maybe they can explain them now and maybe we can uh, take a look at that. Supervisor Spatier. I, I just wanted to make the comment of I, I'm in support, uh, looking forward to uh, where your negotiations end. Hopefully we can have that conversation with the gentleman who uh, may be interested in coming here. Um, all of those things sound good to me. And you, you, you mentioned something that I kind of want to change your words. I hope we can set expectations and that whoever we're working with will be meeting those expectations because we, we are the ones representing the people that are being um, defended and uh, we want to make sure that we set a standard for what those people experience when they go to court. So. Uh, if I may, one of the things that we'd like to be able to bring back with you if, again, you give us the direction to do so is going to be some more definitive uh, list of what can be done immediately, what, <coughs> what we recommend begins over time, and what the longer range goals are. As far as the, the prior report that um, was commissioned at some point, whatever the, whatever the goal of, of that report, it provides no substitution for the hands-on involvement of someone with the type of public defender experience of Mr. Barella and we are hopeful that your board will agree to something along those lines so that there's going to be an on-the-ground person who can work to 
to make improvements, and those improvements would include recommendations for resources and what's lacking. Um, not just, again, it's, you know, criticism apparently can take place in 100 pages, but recommendations just needs to. So um, I don't think that's really lost on anyone in, in regard to that report. Uh, but every system is certainly worthy of improvement and public defender services and the constitutional obligations of this county certainly deserve a very thorough, comprehensive review of how to do better. Uh, just to Supervisor Green's point, uh, we do believe that a, a stronger and better resourced uh, PD defense system will, in, will improve uh, the DA system as well. The tougher the competition is, the higher the DAs will have to raise, will rise to the to the moment. Is the hope? Currently, we don't have any oversight over the, over the DA, this office. We do not. But we do think that um, the better resource the, the the public defenders are, uh, the better trained that they are, the more accountable that they are, uh, the better the fight they're going to put up to the DA's office, and the DA will have to compensate for that. Um, and, and currently, a lot of the things that are being requested and being discussed would require um, more transparent information from LID. And we've started that process. We have been getting more information from them. And we hope that all of our future requests for information um, continually comes as, as quickly as it, as it has, uh, and perhaps with a little bit more detail, so we can truly address these issues and not just leave them in the air as requests that never get answered. I'm going to open it up to the public. I will uh, reintroduce myself. Again, I'm Andrea Sullivan, co-administrator for Lake Indigent Defense, and this is Mr. Feimer, uh, my partner and co-administrator. Um, one of the things I didn't bring up in my last presentation and one of the things that the 6AC um, report fails to mention, what county council fails to mention, and is the giant elephant in the room, is the independent contractor model which LID is based on. The reason why there is no direct supervision is to maintain the public, uh, the independent contractor model. So since as long as I've been in Lake County, which is 2014, and well beyond that, the board has always contracted with an entity that utilizes independent contractors. And part and parcel of that is maintaining the subcontractors' uh, independence from the county, because the county has made clear they do not want to or cannot fund a statutory public defender office, which would be in excess of $4 million. Again, LID handles over 95% of the criminal defendants at a higher, con uh, with some of the lowest dis uh, conviction rates and the highest dismissal, dismissal rates in California. We consistently rake in the top third for uh, higher numbers of dismissals and in the top low third for um, felony convictions. So the result, if you go to trial with a lit attorney, you have probably a 50-50 chance of uh, getting a hung jury or an acquittal, and that is well better than the, uh, the state standard. So the fundamental question is if you, as, an ent as a county, want more direct oversight, at a certain point, uh, the subs are going to be employees. And that comes with additional costs. So there's a fork in the road that this board, it it's one thing to say you want more oversight, but what does that fundamentally mean? We are already paying our subs about two thirds of a comparable county for size and uh, budget. And the way that they can supplement their in income and maintain their independence so they can, we can, we've been audited more than once by EDD. And we can truthfully say these are independent contractors. These are not employees. They're not employees of LID and they're not employees of the county. So um, I, I think that is something that we've been tiptoeing around, but that needs to be addressed head on. 
and myself and Mr. Feimer, we are happy to do whatever the county wants, but the county needs to be clear. Do you want independent contractors, and with that comes a lack of oversight? Or do you want more direct interaction? You're going to make them employees. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, to comment briefly on some can, of the... Can you just state your full name? Yeah, my name is Thomas Feimer. I'm okay, sorry. I uh, shouldn't assume everybody <laughs> it reads... For the record. Yeah, I, and I should be used to that, given I state it multiple times myself every day. Uh, so um, <coughs> I, I want to uh, respond just uh, briefly to a comment Supervisor Green made, which I think is very well taken. Um, there is a tendency and it's not particularly new, but it's increasing uh, for sort of uh, what will happen is the legislature will pass all kinds of new forms of, of relief and mandates and programs. Uh, the b mental health uh, diversion is an example of this and one we've been struggling with. Uh, and the tendency in the within the system is it's unfunded and there's no structure. And the uh, responsibilities all just sort of get passed on to the attorney to sort of actually make all this kind of stuff happen that really what we need are social workers, uh, administ you know, assistants, people to get this stuff done. Uh, where attorneys, uh, I've heard a lot of saying no one's ever defended somebody. You know, if you've ever defended somebody who's facing life in prison, uh, on charges, just that in investigating uh, that and doing that is an immense and very weighty responsibility. Uh, and so, um, again, uh, I, we welcome uh, oversight and we welcome just involvement. You know, we're, we're at 394 Street. Anybody, including anybody here, uh, can come in and talk to us if they want. Or learn more. We're not. We're not some opaque kind of like you know secret cabal over there. Uh, walk on in uh, and set up a meeting and talk with us. Uh, but again, uh, I appreciate and what is needs to be explored. I think is uh, sort of support for the attorneys that kind of frees them to do the job of attorneys in a lot of fashions and invest a, additional funding for investigators, uh, social workers. Uh, administrative assistants are really something that I think do needs to be explored uh, because again taking somebody's you know life into your hands and and defending them and their liberty is is a full-time job uh, and we keep putting more and more burdens on our attorneys to do additional things and they pick up the slack uh, very brilliantly but it comes at a cost eventually. It comes at a cost in uh, burnout. It comes at a cost of uh, maybe having to prioritize things uh, that you otherwise wouldn't want to. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the board chambers? Uh -huh. Anyone in the Zoom room? I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. Um, yeah, I might. Uh, certainly, um, just to clarify, uh, I don't think anyone is attempting to ignore decisions that your board is going to have to make. Uh, as I said, what, what we would like to bring back to you are immediate uh, actions that can be taken and then more long range. Your board is going to have to develop your plan for this as you get more information, more data, more reporting, uh, and hopefully uh, with a consultant's assistant, assistance, a better idea of priorities uh, that at least can be recommended to you. But eventually your board is going to have to, to look at systems and how best you wish to provide services in, in this area. That's a given. Supervisor Sabatier. I just wanted to respond to some of the comments. Uh, just because something's been done a certain way for a while doesn't mean that there's not the possibility of change. It uh, might be difficult, uh, might be seem unattainable, but I think that change is always possible. And on one end, I have um, 
one attorney saying, here are our great stats, and on the other end, but we could do a whole lot better. And I think we all want to do a whole lot better. Uh, and so I think that's, if we can find that common ground, I think that we can move forward and we can figure out a good place to go. Uh, so just want to make that statement. Supervisor Green. Yeah, and just to, uh, to clarify the comment, yeah, the independent contractor is what it is. I don't think it's appropriate for public defense. Um, one of the biggest takes from that report is a lack of ability to know what's going on with all these various contract attorneys to actually maintain independent contractor status. You have to consciously, as LID, not give them express direction on how they handle any particular case. At least if you're holding true to what an independent contractor truly is, you would not be giving that direct direction. So. Um, Thank you for doing what you have under the current model. Um, but I think definitely a pivot is a forthcoming, expensive as it might be, and change in business models as might be required. But um, I, I get I get where you've been in your journey, and I appreciate it. Uh, but you know, very clearly to me, to the specific point of whether independent contractors are going to continue to be a thing, uh, I hope as we move forward, uh, we'll realize pretty soon that isn't working out very well. Thank you. Vice Chair Simon. Yeah, I just appreciate the, uh, you know, the obviously the conversation from both sides, but, you know, I think what's presented to us today is the right step at this point. So in complete support, <clears throat> you know, because everything always needs to be looked at and change is hard, but we all know that what we're talking about is someone's complete life, a young man or young woman or whoever, however they uh, represent themselves are. Um, it's crucial. It's crucial to their life, uh, the path they take. Um, and we need to just make sure we can do and try and do better. Um, we all know that. I don't know, uh, coming from the Native American community on our side, you know, that representation uh, is so important. And when you go into a courtroom, if you're paying for legal representation or you're not, we know there's a disparity there. And we know those opportunities for folks that can do that. So I'm wholeheartedly behind it. I don't have the answers. I am not an attorney. I'll never say or even act like one. I might talk as much as one, but I, I will not know. But, um, you know, I appreciate the difficult conversations we're having right now because it could change someone's life, and that's the most important thing that we always need to consider. That's all I have to say. I appreciate you coming in, and um, you know, we have this report. We have, we're committed to uh, working together to make things better. Um, and I, you know, looking at the short-term and long-term goals, that's that's something that we're going to need to follow up on as well. And and the resources um, that are needed to do the work to support both LID and uh, the defendant. So appreciate you coming in, appreciate the willingness to work. It's not an easy conversation, um, but we're all here to do the hard thing. So thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, one well, no, more comment okay. from okay. Supervisor Crandall. No, I do appreciate uh, the, the, you know, the recommendations. Um, you know, Having an advisory committee really would help. I know um, a lot of times uh, indigent families aren't familiar with legal processes and um, usually have to depend on other family members to uh, count on that have experience. And I know for me, I understand that uh, in regards to the, uh, to the agency that's speaking today, I know that they can get quite overwhelmed at times. And then not to mention the whole situation with COVID doing a lot of you know the Zoom meetings and you know Zoom the Zoom court um, having some of these um, hearings over at the fairgrounds and so I, you know I I, I know that um, you know there may be conflicting uh, ideas about what was done in the report but at the same time this gives an opportunity to uh, get back on track regardless or at least have a path forward you know so that's my opinion. Supervisor Spatian. Just a last comment. I, I want to thank CAO Parker for her uh, prior presentation, her words um, that we share responsibility in making sure that this goes 
in the right direction. And I, I, I think that's a key part to this is not pointing any fingers rather than saying we're not doing good enough and we need to do better. And I just wanted to express that because I don't know how many people specifically heard. I'm not going to repeat it, uh, but I appreciated the comment. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, we will close out this item. Thank you for being here. I just want to kind of understand some timing on some of these items that we have. Um, I'm guessing seven <coughs> seven will be a, a little lengthy, or is that should we do that one after lunch? Anita. It doesn't calipers? seem because we talked about. How long do you estimate calipers to be? Really? That's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, we don't have to get to it now. I'm just trying to look No, at I think that, I, I think that the item probably will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. And Crystal, and your staff is here. What, what, how? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Why don't we, why don't we go to 7.9? Consideration of Lake County Social Services CalFresh and Medi-Cal program update. That's item 7.9. Good morning, board. Crystal Markitan, Director for Social Services, and with me today is Rachel Dillman, our Eligibility Program Manager. Today, um, Rachel will be doing a very short presentation uh, regarding the Medi-Cal and CalFresh program um, unwinding of benefits that were um, in place during the pandemic. And so this will have a significant impact on both um, people living, citizens of Lake County, and also um, the economy. And so we want to make sure that everyone is aware that this is happening. Rachel? All right. Thank you. Uh, as Crystal said, my name is Rachel Zillman. I'm a program manager at Lake County Social Services. And I have some program updates for you and the public today on Medi-Cal and CalFresh benefits. We're going back to uh, business as usual, essentially, is what's happening as the uh, COVID waivers uh, come to an end with uh, the end of the public health emergency declarations. So the updates I have for you today are with regard to um, CalFresh and Medi-Cal, and then I'll touch on PEBT. So the um, largest impact is going to be regarding the end of CalFresh emergency allotments. CalFresh, if you don't know what the program is, is uh, formerly known as food stamps. It uh, provides assistance to low-income families to purchase food. Um, during the pandemic, since March of 2020, um, Congress authorized emergency allotments, which are an extra benefit that provided at least an extra $95 to all CalFresh households. The average monthly allotment that CalFresh households received was actually $231 uh, per month, and some households received significantly more. So um, as these benefits come to an end, it is going to have a large impact on our customers. Uh, just to provide some statistical data, uh, in January of 2023, we issued $4.5 million in CalFresh benefits just here in Lake County to nearly 16,000 individuals. $1.7 million of those benefits were emergency allotments, so approximately 38% of the CalFresh benefits issued in January were emergency allotments, and that is the portion that will be ending. The emergency allotments are ending in March 2023, the last issuance will be on March 26th. So notices have gone out to all of our CalFresh customers. Those notices started mailing the week of January 17th. And we do recognize this is gonna create a huge economic impact on our recipients as well as the local economy. So we're trying to get the word out here so people can be as prepared as possible. Um, every dollar in CalFresh benefits does generate approximately $1.50 in local economic activity. 
This is a change in law, so we are not able to issue emergency allotments beyond the end of these benefits. So for our customers, what happens next? They are going to get less CalFresh starting in April of 2023. The regular issuance is the amount put on the customer's EBT card between the first and the 10th of the month. And those benefits are based on their individual circumstances, such as their household size and income. And as I said, this is a mass change, so it's, it's a law change. There's nothing we can do to issue special emergency allotments beyond the end of these benefits. A state hearing judge will not be able to order us to pay these benefits beyond their end. So we do want customers to be aware of the uh, food bank resources available to them. The best place to get that information would be on our Facebook page. We have it pinned to the top of our page. That's Lake County Social Services. And if they have any questions, they can give us a call. Uh, the state hotline for emergency allotments is 1-800, or excuse me, 1-888-445-1955. Or they can give our office a call, 707-995-4200. Another update with regard to the CalFresh program is that temporary student exemptions are ending. The uh, pre-pandemic student exemptions will continue to exist, but during the pandemic, there were two special exemptions for students that would allow them to enroll in the CalFresh program. And that was students eligible for work study and students with expected family contribution of $0 in financial aid. When the federal public health emergency ends on May 11th, these uh, exemptions will go away. So new applicants, the old rules will be applied to. And students currently receiving CalFresh will not have the new rules applied until the recertification is due. So over the next year, as they recertify their eligibility for benefits, we'll re-examine their situation and help them uh, move into a different exemption if they're eligible for a different exemption. So students right now don't need to do anything. And the last big change is the end of Medi-Cal continuous coverage. So Medi-Cal provides health insurance to low and middle income families and continuous coverage ensured with, with few exceptions that people on Medi-Cal kept their Medi-Cal coverage throughout the pandemic. So as this waiver unwinds, uh, our goal is to keep as many people who remain eligible enrolled in Medi-Cal, and if they are no longer eligible, to transition them over into covered California. So as a, a data point, in Lake County, we have uh, over 30,000 individuals enrolled in Medi-Cal as of December of 2022, and we will have 12 months to recertify everybody's eligibility. We start processing recertifications in June of 2023, with the first potential month where customers would lose benefits being July of 2023. So informational notices regarding this change to medical recipients have also already started mailing. Those started going out in February. And um, right now what beneficiaries should do is make sure we have their correct mailing address. The best way to do that, uh, you can give us a call, 707-995-4200. Go online to benefitscal.com. That's B-E-N-E-F-I-T-S-C-A-L.com. Or they can come by our offices in person, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. That's 15975 Anderson Ranch, Lower Lake, California. And we can assist them in making sure their mailing address is correct. Um, beneficiaries will receive their renewal packets between April 2023 and March 2024, we have a 12 month window where we're reinstating recertifications. They don't need to take any action until they receive that recertification packet. Uh, their benefits will remain the same until it comes time for them to renew. So this is gonna be a big workload effort for my staff. Uh, and we're gonna be all hands on deck. Uh, we are going to be launching a counter service unit uh, on site at Anderson Ranch for people who have questions about how to fill out their paperwork, uh, get new paperwork if they've lost their paperwork, that'll be launching in March. And uh, we're looking forward to partnering with the Department of Health Health Services to meet these challenges over the coming year and make sure as many people as are eligible remain enrolled in Medi-Cal. 
Um, there is a public state website launching with more information if people are interested in keeping an eye on that. It's keepmedicalcoverage.org, K-E-E-P-M-E-D-I-C-A-L-C-O-V-E-R-A-G-E.org. And then lastly, I'll provide just a really quick update on PEBT. We don't administer this program. Um, it is administered by the California Department of Social Services, but I get asked about it a lot. So as it is also tied to the pandemic, I'll provide a quick update. So Pandemic EBT, or PEBT, is a federal program that gave families uh, food to replace lost meals, uh, lost at childcare or school due to the pandemic, and these benefits are also tied to the public health emergency. The final round of PEBT is in the works. The state is putting together their plan for federal approval, and they hope to have those benefits issued by September of 2023. So as details regarding that plan come out, the public can keep an eye on capandemic excuse me, dash ebt.org or give the PEBT helpline a call. That's 877-328-9677. And that is all I had to share today. Supervisor Crandall. Yeah, thank you for that uh, report or that presentation. I just wanted to highlight that SNAP, which is basically hand in hand with CalFresh, right? It's the same thing. SNAP is the federal name for it, and CalFresh is what California calls it. It, it helps for people to know that because a lot of times, uh, you know, when you when you watch the news, you hear them say SNAP, and so um, and it was discussed quite frequently in the fly-in that I had in D.C. in visiting the represent representatives and even in the NACO conference and. Um, when we went to Feinstein and Thompson's office, uh, and I, the others, I didn't attend those, but it was it was discussed, and they're worried throughout this year that it might be attacked. If that makes any sense, uh, it, not attacked, but you know, it might be you know, yes, or an attempt to reform and reduce or something along those lines. So I just um, I know that that was advocated on our behalf because a lot of our counties have the same amount of. Um, citizens that qualify for this benefit um, just um, in fact EBT cards uh, food distribution programs and then all others on Indian reservations that's a very big uh, uh, it's a big resource in this county and so I'm worried about that also I know another uh, benefit and is the fact that SSI and SSP benefits may qualify for for uh, for individuals in our county, and I'm only highlighting that because not a lot of folks might know that, or they do, but I just know that some uh, that transition happened pre-pandemic. But yeah, um, let's yeah. remind the public that if you're on SSI SSP, you could potentially qualify for CalFresh benefits now. Yeah, no, I, I know it did, but I know that sometimes there's some folks that I don't, I'm not qualified for it because I'm on SSI, and no, that changed, you know. So just mm -hmm. giving that a shot, and I know too that this is mainly about a lot of the uh, legislation or the um, not legislation, but the programs that were put pandemic-wise are coming to a halt. But I just want to throw those out there and let you know as well that it was discussed quite frequently um, in D.C. Yeah, it's it's certainly a, a big change. I mean, these benefits have been issuing for three years now, um, so we're aware that's going to be a big impact to a lot of family budgets. So trying to get the word out so people are prepared. Thanks. It's a difficult time with food prices being so high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Supervisor Spatier. Yeah, I, <clears throat> in reading through this and listening through the presentation as well, um, I just I, I want to be thankful for those that have food giveaways uh, throughout the county. I know that you put out that resource every month as to uh, where people can find those resources. Um, and so I'm not going to name them because there's too many to name right now, and I'm going to miss some. But all of those that are involved in food giveaways within different varying communities, um, Thank you for your efforts because it's going to help those that uh, may be a little set back by this, especially as Chair Paiska just mentioned, the increases in food cost. Uh, this is not a good timing. Or if it doesn't sure. cover enough, you know, that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone from the public? Let's see, anyone in the chambers? And there's no one in Zoom. So, any final yeah, comments from final the board? Comment. I appreciate the report and obviously getting the message out there. I know some folks, I think, are already starting to get some letters or notifications that there's changes coming. Um, I'd appreciate 
you know, as we're rolling through it and things are happening, you know, maybe a six month follow up of this is what, you know, this is how many the cases that are affected in here. But I, I know it's going to affect a lot of people in the county. Like I said, have got, you know, family members or other folks that are on some of these programs and, you know, they're already talking about some some large decreases in some some cases where, you know, we're getting one hundred and fifty dollars. Now you can get seventeen dollars. Right. Uh, so it's going to be challenging as we move through that. So I just appreciate, you know, kind of over the next 18 months or whenever everything's rolling, we're being cut off that we, you know, get some reports on that. So I'm in favor of that. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so it's noon. I think we can do one more. And I'd like to do 7.8 if um, Lars is available. All right. Thank you, Lars. There All right. Is. You bet. Sorry, you caught me off guard here. I'll grab my grab my papers. All right. So, uh, Board, I appreciate you taking up this item. Uh, Lars Ewing, Public Services Director. Uh, up for consideration today is conceptual approval for the purchase of real property uh, for a Cobb area community park uh, and to appoint a negotiating team. Um, so this, uh, the way this process is, is presented, it's, it's in line with, uh, with the county's uh, real property policy um, that includes a, a process for uh, uh, the, the purchase of any real property. And the, uh, the first step or one of the first steps uh, is to get conceptual approval uh, from your board of supervisors uh, to appoint a negotiating team that will then come back to your board um, with a, a summary of the <coughs> uh, one of which is um, uh, the, the negotiations that would occur. Uh, so this, what's up for consideration is not purchase of um, uh, nor approval of that property, but, but simply um, uh, moving ahead with, uh, with uh, conceptual approval of the property for, for ultimate negotiations. And, and that includes pulling an appraisal uh, uh, doing uh, environmental research on the uh, on the property and, and a variety of, of different different things. So, some background on a Cobb area park. Um, the, the memo does spell it out, but I want to highlight the fact that um, that it is it is the only uh, the only planning area in Lake County that does not have a a county park. Um, that's uh, the the need for this for a park in Cobb is is not new. Um, there are um, the, the general plan points uh, points to the desire to have that. The, the Cobb area plan points to it. We've had a, a number of uh, a number of public meetings over the last few years that have identified uh, a, a park, a community park in Cobb, as a as a desire of the community. Uh, this year, this fiscal year, uh, your board your board um, uh, appropriated a million dollars uh, to begin just that a, a park uh, in in the Cobb area. Uh, there was there was discussion of, of the trails network as well, um, and so this is one of the steps associated with that. So i um, happy to answer any questions um, and to, to really summarize it, the, the negotiating committee um, would be uh, recommended to be a member of public services, me or my designee, uh, and then the county administrative officer or her designee. So happy to an answer any questions. Thank you, Lars. And um, also just a reminder that the million dollars that was allocated for this project is from geothermal royalties, which are specifically for the community um, to mitigate the effects of living near geothermal. Um, so questions from the board? Supervisor Spatier? Yeah, I want to thank Chair Paiska and uh, Director uh, Ewing for taking my calls yesterday regarding this. Uh, I, I think every community deserves to have a community park, um, Cobb area being one of those that does not have one. And so um, I'm okay with moving forward, but I do want to ask when we receive the f next step information, is there going to be information on potential cost for maintenance, potential cost for staffing and things like that as well? We, we certainly could provide that to you, uh, um, absolutely. And then that could be, uh, to be honest, considered at February 28th. I'm proposing an update to the uh, to your board on the, uh, the master plan for uh, parks, recreation, and trails. So that could be something that uh, that could go concurrent with that. Okay, because that's, that's the only part that I want to make sure that we can sustain uh, what it is that we try to add to our list of parks, because uh, it's always a, a sad thing to see parks uh, go into disarray or, or not be up to the par that we want it to be. So uh, that's, that's what I would ask. Definitely. 
Yeah, and I, that's going to be developed with a concept, um, which is what we're looking at here. And also, just remember that the, um, the geothermal funds also support all of the parks around the county. And so this is the opportunity to actually have the park supported by the funds that are intended for that community. So uh, anything, oh, Supervisor Green? Yeah, just a, que it, just a question, um, uh, but I know the uh, golf course across the way <clears throat> is in private hands, um, may have changed hands in recent years. I know they used to have disc golf out there and then they pulled it back. I don't know that the ball golf is paying the bills. Um, so I'm just wondering if that was looped in in the initial consideration of property owners that were contacted. Uh, you know, I think the site right across from the golf course, fine, if that's the best it is, but we have a partially developed parcel right there uh, that, that may be suited for expansion of this park if we continue with this property, or, or I'm just curious if any inquiries were made as to that. No. So um, Lars has conducted the visioning process, which is um, how you go about uh, starting a project like this. You ask the community what they're looking at. And that par parcel is private. It's private property. It was part of the conversation um, over time. But um, you know, the visioning process is pretty specific. We don't tell the community what kind of park we want to build. The community tells us. And so all that information has been collected. Uh, I think you had two sessions, Lars? We've had, yeah, we, aside from that, there have been surveys that, uh, that right. went up back a few years. But yes, we, we did have a couple of meetings. Yeah. And I, I do want maybe just to that point, we, we uh, over the last few years, that, that, that golf course has, has come up. It's, uh, uh, you know, been, been for sale, not for sale. Uh, and, and when we look at the, the size of the golf course, um, a community park is, is something quite a bit different than a, than a regional park. You know, the size of, of that golf course is something that, uh, going back to Supervisor Sabatier's point, uh, the, the maintenance costs would, would, uh, would go up. There's, there's no question about that in comparison to a, a community, um, kind of a neighborhood type park. Um, so it, it based on, on what the desire of, of the, the, the public in the Cobb area, uh, what their desire is, is, is for a relatively small, but, but um, big enough to be used, certainly, but not, not a regional type park that uh, certainly a, a golf course type of uh, facility would, would qualify under. Okay, I'll open up to the public. Uh, Robert Stark, uh, I have applied for and received uh, in excess of $200,000 from this fund for uh, infrastructure projects by the Cobb Mutual Water Company at that time. Uh, we haven't received any funding uh, in recent years from the Geothermal Mitigation Fund or the AB 1905 fund, which this is, one must realize that my personal property, I do not own anything but the surface. The state of California owns everything below the surface. And if geothermal royalties are paid, unless they travel across my property, I get nothing. The state of California gets that. Now I only have six acres, so that's only $96 a year at the $16.50 an acre they offered me in 1975. But one must realize that these funds are at the cost of the property owners of Cobb. No one else but the property owners. The Binkley Ranch, 1,600 acres. 800 acres of that property was homesteaded. AB 1905 took the mineral rights away from that 800 acres. So they received nothing for the steam below their feet. Because they, for that 800 acres, they only own the surface of that. So when you think about these royalties, these are the fees that the people, the landowners in Cobb, are not getting. And so we should at least get the benefits of some 
And I realized we used to get them in the 80s. Then the state <laughs> took all of them. Then the state gave some back and you bought some property on top of some mountain down here. And now they're giving them back to you for you to distribute. But you need to understand that that money belongs in the Cobb area. It doesn't belong in Upper Lake, Lower Lake, Glen Haven, Nice, Lucerne, Upper Lake, Middletown and Cobb are the only place where the geothermal resource is and the only place where the state of California has taken the property rights away from the landowners and has benefited financially from it. So, like I said, we have gotten the Cobb area, the, the then Cobb Mutual Water Company, we're a district now since 91, but we have received monies from from this fund thank you days in the past yeah thank you well and some of the royalties are earmarked for infrastructure and some of them are not and so that's the difference for the benefit of the rest of the board and so these are the these are the funds that are not earmarked earmarked for infrastructure improvements uh good morning i'm tom slate again i had a few thoughts on this i saw this on the agenda this item and i thought um well how did that happen I'm, I'm not opposing anything uh, as far as what's going on with the park and Mr. Lars, or Lars Earwing, whatever his name, pardon me, anyway, Lars. Um, but it was uh, the process that interests me. Uh, he said, uh, I think we had uh, discussions, well, they may be more like presentations. I don't know. I mean, it looks like it's going in the right direction other than the cost of maintenance. But... Um, I would have preferred something, and maybe we didn't have like a public hearing where people can be specific and have it entered into the record what they said. This seems to me rather loose knit sort of process. And uh, so really that's what I had to say. I, I'm questioning the, the process of how we're getting to something that might turn out all right. I mean, I, I think this was kind of a, it was gonna happen one way or another, this money for a park, but anyway, I'm questioning the, pro the process. Again, I'm still clarifying as I stand here that the people could be on the record saying whatever they had to say. Thank you. Sure, Lars, um, do you wanna comment on the visioning process? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, and I, I don't disagree with, with anything that, that the, um, the individual man spoke about there. Um, I think it's important to note that what, what we're talking about here is, is just conceptual approval of, of, a, of a property that, that we are looking to, uh, to get more information on, um, uh, pull an appraisal, um, start, uh, start negotiations with the property owner. We're, we're not purchasing that. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing to say that the, the next step that would come to the public is um, is board approval of the, the purchase of this property. Uh, there are, uh, there have been visionings that, that, have, that have occurred. Uh, there have been uh, public meetings going through primarily through the Cobb Area Council, um, um, but also other other meetings. We had a uh, we had a meeting at the Little Red Schoolhouse. Uh, some that, that come off the, the top of my head, um, but I, I think it's entirely appropriate to um, to have some more forms that include public input uh, prior to. Uh, signing on the dotted line, so to speak, of, of this property, we we uh, we we have uh, a lot of work to do to to identify how the uh, how this property would uh, would work. We we need information to to move uh, to move ahead, and that's the next step. That's the, the well, not the next step. That is the way the the county's uh, uh, policy is written. So we we need we need to take this step in order to uh, um, to take the you know steps two, three, and four. Right, thank you. And every single month at the Cobb Area Council meeting, I'm asked on this process. So that group is incredibly willing um, to be uh, to participate in this process. As our members that don't participate in the Cobb Area Council, I was just asked yesterday what the pro what's the status of the Cobb Park. So the community is very eager and excited for this project. If there's is there anyone else in the chambers? Okay, let me go to the Zoom room. Looks like we have two hands up. We'll start with um, Chris Nettles. If you want to unmute and state your name for the record. Uh, I am unmuted. Hopefully you can yes, hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Great. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Christopher Nettles. I am treasurer of the Cobb Area Council. I'm also a community psychologist, which means that I specialize in community level behavioral health, population prevention science, and well-being. 
I'd like to speak in support of this item from the perspective of the Cobb Area Council and as a health professional. First, from my perspective as a Cobb Area Council treasurer, since 2020, I've been deeply involved with the uh, participatory community process, along with a well-known uh, local nonprofit, SSCRA, that resulted in the creation of the Cobb Resilience and Development Strategy, published in 2022 and available on the Cobb Area Council website. We included creation of a park uh, in the Cobb Mountain area as a major priority in that development strategy because it was a consistent theme and requested by many residents. Also during that same time period, um, <coughs> Mr. Uh, uh, mentioned he visited Cobb at least twice to gather community input on this proposal. So visioning for the um, park project has already happened. The community has given their extensive feedback on what they want which, um, as I recall, is a natural landscape community park requiring uh, pretty low maintenance, uh, from what I recall. Uh, as Mr. Ewing pointed out, Cobb is the only area in the county without a community park. And as Supervisor Paiska noted, um, I hear her asked at every Cobb Area Council, pe uh, council meeting uh, about this project. Uh, and I just want to reiterate Mr. Stark's, uh, Robert Stark's comment about the geothermal royalty funds that was set aside especially intended to mitigate the effects of geothermal in and around our community. So that includes promoting health and well-being. Uh, there's not been a project done with this money in our community since the 1980s. So as a community psychologist, I can speak about the enormous health benefits to people that result from having public spaces available for recreation and community gathering. You all know how challenged this county is regard to all major health statistics. We often come in at or near the bottom of statewide county comparisons. The county's attention to our population health issues through participation in the Blue Zones project would seem to lend support to building a park in Cobb as well, where one does not currently exist. So this park is important to the Cobb area. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of this item and to lend my full support to it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, looks like that's all we have in the Zoom room. And we'll bring it back to the board. And it looks like just the recommended action is to provide Conceptual approval for the acquisition of property located at, we don't need a motion for this or just consensus? You may need a motion because okay. the, the agenda says appoint a negotiating team. Okay. Make the motion for me. Yes. Uh, Madam, if there's no more discussion, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move to approve all right, let's see. Let me just, we're going to start here. I'd like to move, uh, make a motion to appoint a negotiating team that includes public services director or designee and county administrative officer for the property 16540 State Highway 175 on Cobb. Would that work? Or did I mix it all up? If I could just offer the, the or adding the or designee uh, for the I, county I, administrative I, officer. I think I did say. I, I heard it for the public services director, just not for the county. Oh, okay. For public services director, designee, and county administrative officer or designee. Sorry. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. I think it's time for lunch, but I just want to just check with everyone that we're all on the same page. <laughs> okay. Um, just, just suggestion. You think yeah. we could knock out the 7.5? Okay. Let's see what that is. Cool. I think you already lost. Uh... Oh, if we lost, that's all right. That's fine. Just... Oh, no. 7.5 is fine. Sorry. I thought you meant the Laco one because I know. No. no 7.5 is just consideration of the following. Oh, sure. Yes. Board appointments. Okay. 7.5 consideration of the following <clears throat> advisory appointments animal care and control. Advisory Board, Child Care Planning and Development Council, Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee, Scotts Valley Community Advisory Committee. Supervisor Spadier. I'll speak on the first one, Animal Care and Control. That's um, Lieutenant Martin Schneider from uh, the 
Clear Lake Police Department, who is in charge of the Clear Lake Animal Control, and I really want the interaction between our Lake County Animal Control and Clear Lake Animal Control, and so I was waiting for his application, and I'm happy to uh, move forward on that. Okay, public input on Martin Schneider. I'm not seeing any. Okay, bringing it back. Madam Chair, I move to approve Martin Schneider to the Animal Control, Animal Care and Control Advisory Board. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Child Care Planning and Development Council. We have three. We have three applicants. Um, I can speak to Cassandra Johnson. Uh, she has been involved in child care for a long time. I believe is uh, working with. Uh, Oh, I forget the name of the uh, agency, uh, uh, but providing uh, help for uh, youth with special needs and uh, takes part in our first five conversation as well as the child uh, council. And so uh, definitely a good uh, candidate to place on there. Okay. Any public comment? Okay. Bringing it back. Um, and the rest seem like uh, appropriate uh, additions as well and I think we might as well just do all three at the same time if anyone unless somebody objects and seeing none I move to approve uh, Cassandra Johnson as community representative Miriam McNamara uh, discretionary appointee and Kimberly gentle child care provider to the child care planning and development council second motion and a second all in favor aye, aye. opposed motion passes and Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee we have seven vacancies. Um, you know, I was looking on the, the spreadsheet on our website and has that been updated because it, it has all the past uh, advisors with them all expiring in 2023. So there's just a little confusion on the county website when I was looking at it yesterday. It's not updated. It's not updated, okay. But these are the current vacancies we have. Agriculture, District 1, District 3, District 5, Education, Fish and Wildlife Conservation, and Land Conservation. If I may correct, District 1, I believe, is filled. It starts with District 2. Oh, sorry. Correct. Okay. So we have one um, applicant for a reappointment, Greg Giusti. I think that's an appropriate uh, yeah. addition. Not addition, reappointment. Okay. Public input? Okay, bring it back. Madam Chair, I move to approve Greg Giusti to the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee. Second. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And we also give instruction to, uh, this is going to be an important committee moving forward. Some of our other committees have had trouble filling themselves up. So just as I had to re-advertise for uh, this next committee we're talking about, it might be appropriate to re-advertise uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Committee. Uh, we need to fill that out. Okay. Scotts Valley Community Advisory Council. And just to respond, I'm okay with that as far as uh, requiring consensus? Yes. Yep. Uh, speaking of councils, that kind of came and went. So uh, uh, we had uh, all five of our council members' terms ended uh, on January 1. So a couple weeks ago, this board did pass a resolution. We're going to set staggered terms uh, after we uh, make these five appointments. Uh, I do want to thank everyone who applied on short notice. And uh, uh, it, it was a little doing. <laughs> but I think we're on track. Uh, <coughs> and I have reviewed all the applications. This district, uh, for the most part, falls within my district. A little slice maybe up in uh, EJ's. Um, but I do have uh, uh, five people I'd like to recommend for appointment. Uh, and so while giving thanks to Ms. Goldenbrook and Mr. Grothy, I would like to recommend that we move forward with appointments for Gregory Scott, Jared Hendricks, Jason Weston, Cornelia Sieber Davis, and Jody Altick. And following action on that, uh, we'll have a little lottery to set who gets the uh, staggered terms here. Okay, public comment. All right, bringing it back. 
Is that in the form of a motion? That is in the form of a motion. Uh, uh, following the appointment, we will uh, uh, stagger the terms by lot with the assistance from our, our uh, board clerk. Second. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion passes. And uh, if county council will back me up on this, I believe the names of the five appointees are in there. If Johanna can select two pieces of paper out of there, we will appoint those to the one-year terms, and the remaining three in the bag will be appointed to two-year terms. All right. So we got um, Gregory Scott and... Jason Weston. All right. And if I did my homework right... Mr. Scott and Mr. Weston have been appointed to terms that expire on January 1, 2024, and the remainder three will be appointed to terms that end on January 1, 2025. That was new. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, do we have another five-minute one or so, or should we just do the rest of them after? What about one of the pulled consent? We have 5.2 left. Is that a... Well, maybe we'll just take lunch. Okay. <laughs> All right, we will meet <coughs> back here at 1.30. Okay, thanks so much. All right, welcome back from lunch. We will s we'll start with item 5.2, Supervisor Sabatier. Uh, thank you very much. And so uh, the reason I pulled this item is because I do not approve of the way that we're adding this. I do approve of adding the holiday, but I, again, just like last time, feel that we are adding, uh, this is almost a $300,000 addition of taxpayers' money of a day off, uh, and I'd like, I would have liked for us to go through the MOU process negotiations for days that are not holidays that are currently on there, and so this is not about the holiday we're adding, this is about the process on how to get it on there, and so just wanted to make sure that my vote was, um, taken appropriately rather than just uh, going through consent like the rest. Okay. Any other supervisors? Okay. Public input? I'm not seeing any in the chambers. And nothing in Zoom. All right. So we'll bring it back to the board for action. A lot of actions in there. Can it be an A through J, or do we need to do them individually? Uh, individually would be preferred. All right. Well, it wasn't broken down that way, but I think I would start off by moving to approve revisions of Personnel Rule 1801 holidays, adding Juneteenth as a county paid holiday. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank. Okay. I think I heard an A. Okay. Next. Uh, move to approve a side letter to Lake County Correctional Officers Association, October 21, 2121, through June 30, 2025, MOU. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Move to approve a side letter to Lake County Deputy District Attorneys Association, October 21, 2021, through June 30, 2025, MOU. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Losing my thing. Move to approve a side letter to Lake County Deputy Sheriff's Association, October 21, 2021, through June 30, 2025, MOU. All Aye. in favor? Oh, oh, second. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. All right, move to approve a side letter to Lake County Employees Association Units 3, 4, 5, October 21, 2021, through June 30, 2025, MOU. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Nay. Move to approve a side letter to Lake County Safety Employees Association, October 21, 2021 through June 30, 2025, MOU. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Move to approve a side letter to Lake County Sheriff's Management Association, November 1, 2021 through June 30, 2025, MOU. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Move to adopt. Offer the, Offer the resolution amending resolution number 2021-122 establishing salaries and benefits for employees assigned to the confidential unit section A for October 21, 2021 to June 30, 2025. Okay. Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabatier? Nay. Supervisor Crandall? Aye. Supervisor Green? Aye. And Supervisor Pyscott? Yes. Offer the resolution amending resolution 2021-123 establishing salaries and benefits for employees assigned to the confidential unit section B for October 21, 2021 to June 30, 2025. Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabatier? Nay. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor uh, Green? Aye. Supervisor Paiska? Yes. Thanks. <sighs> Offer the resolution amending resolution number 2021-124 establishing salaries and benefits for management employees for the period from November 1, 2021 to June 30, 2025. Okay, Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabatier? Nay. Supervisor Crandall? Aye. Supervisor Green? Aye. And Supervisor Paisca? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Okay, item 7.6, presentation of update on planning services contract between the County of Lake and Laco Associates for processing cannabis-related use permit applications. Director Turner. Thank you. Mireya Turner, Community Development Department. Uh, towards the end of December in 2022, on December 21st, the county entered into an agreement with LACO Associates to offer planning uh, services to assist with the processing of our cannabis grants. These services included, but were not limited to, the technical analysis, the uh, environmental analysis for CEQA, and staff reports. Last summer, the end of July, on July 26th, the board received an update regarding LACO's progress so far, and at that time requested another update six months from then, uh, which is what we have here before you today. Uh, one thing I'd like to add, and um, I will turn it over to Deputy Planning. Deputy, yes. Director for LACO. Uh, Byron Turner in just a moment um, and then we're um, he'll give his presentation which will have some new information since the memorandum that they did submit was actually dated in January and they've been pretty busy since then um, and then if there's anything else we're both available for questions additionally I do have some information from the narrative for our local jurisdiction assistance grant uh, to process the cannabis grants that we're working on upstairs that will be available for you after that too thank you thank you Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Byron Turner with LACO Associates. I wanted to update your numbers since that memo that we're provided to you was dated in January. Um, at this time, uh, by my count, we have now been assigned 92 cannabis projects um, from the county. Uh, since then, there have been four additional approvals at the Planning Commission. There will be two more projects going next week to the Planning Commission. Um, seven more are in the queue with staff reports ready to go. We're just verifying some information. We've found that an abundance of caution is necessary when these projects have changed so many times over the course of the last few years as, uh, as the laws change, uh, projects change. And so we are confirming with applicants this is indeed the canopy. This is indeed the location. This is, these are indeed the license types. Um, we are also reviewing at the request of the Community Development Department and the Planning Commission reviewing hydrogeology reports and drought management plans. Um, our senior geologist, uh, principal geologist, is in the Zoom room, um, or at least was earlier today. Um, if you have any questions about, about uh, what we're doing there. 
Um, with that said, you know, we continue to process applications and reduce the backlog, and we've worked with the county to streamline the streamline the permitting process, and we're working directly with applicants to help them um, <coughs> create a more uh, complete application. Most of the applications that have been forwarded to LACO were not staff report ready. We've had to work with the applicants to update them based on the changes in the, in the rules, the early activation, the farmland protection zone, um, and the hydrology reports. So that has taken some time to get everybody up to speed, but I believe now we're in a place where we can really um, exponentially <coughs> process applications. If I could just add a little bit to that, there have been um, there has been considerable effort within our department to update, upgrade, and improve the quality of our staff reports. So our um, our cannabis program manager has been working with Byron to revamp the initial study template that we use to allow for a more robust environmental analysis, as well as um, we've made considerable modifications within our staff report style um, and formatting to make sure that our information is also robust in there too. That has taken some time. Um, it's, it, I wasn't sure about the exact place we needed to go when I first got here, so I've taken some time to evaluate that and work with staff. Um, but I think we're, in a, we're, we're getting to a pretty good place now, particularly for cannabis grants. And the, the stylistic and, and uh, content-related improvements that we've made will actually carry over into all our non-cannabis um, documentation as well. Okay, Supervisor Sabatier. Can you provide that date again for when the original data was from? You said it was January. January, uh, I believe, 13th. 13th. And then you provided uh, <clears throat> some data on uh, that you had 16 projects uh, that basically were completed. One uh, was continued to a later date. One was denied and 14 were reviewed. Was that... 14 since the last time we met in July, or was that 14 for the entirety of our relationship that we've had since August of 2021? Well, there's been more than 14 reviewed. Um, there's been, or maybe maybe you mean approved at the Planning Commission? Well, you use different language for, because um, I went back to July and grabbed all those mm -hmm. numbers, uh, but the numbers that you provided in this memo uh, that are dated from January 13th. Anyway. Are they for the entirety of the entire uh, scope of our work together since August of 2021, or is it since a specific date? That reflects the entirety of uh, since the 2021, although I should point out that we weren't working on projects when the, the, we were hired in 2021. In August of uh, 2021? Yeah. Okay. Um, but you were in the review process, at least, uh, to yeah, provide when, some When LACO started, we started uh, staffing, basically staffing in-house in the planning department while there was no planning director in place. And then um, eventually we're assigned to one project and then went from there. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to give out some numbers of where we were in July. Uh, in July, it looked like we had six projects that were completed. Um, here it shows 16 in the memo. Again, please correct me if that's incorrect, but that's what I, I see in there. Um, before, there was 37 project review status memos. Now we're at 53. Um, looks like there's been a whole lot of initial reviews conducted because that number was 77. Um, what what exactly does initial review is like uh, pre application type of thing or it would be past pre application but it would be reviewing it for completeness and then advising the county on what necess what what uh, items were necessary to complete the project okay okay which is a process that you spoke of that uh, helps um, expedite the processes and making sure that you don't push something far ahead knowing that you're missing some information. Um, then I, I, I got some information that I requested from staff uh, for the entire year of uh, 2022 because uh, we had a contract for uh, from July 1st to December 31st for 2021 uh, for 400000 Then we had a contract from January 1st to December 31st for another $400,000. And it looks like here um, the services cost us about $291,000. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that was made public, um, and, and 
I'll give uh, I'll give my opinion and then I'll, I'll give my final statement. Um, for two hundred ninety-one thousand, for sixteen projects to have gone through the entire process um, over the course of at least let's say a year, not since August, in my opinion, seems dismal uh, in the sense that my opinion is when we contract with somebody we're, 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 we're contracting because the expertise is there to already be efficient and to to provide that um, expertise that maybe we didn't have in-house to be able to maneuver through the processes uh, and, and I'll say if it wasn't for my conversation with uh, director Turner uh, who tells me that things are really turning around um, I, I, I don't know how I would feel about the limited numbers that I'm seeing here and I am going to give Director Turner the benefit of the doubt that things are going to turn around and we're going to see a lot more efficiency um, and, and things moving forward. Because uh, I, I feel like we're always kind of talking about the same large numbers of applications that's within your um, department specifically for cannabis. And the purpose was to try to dwindle that down, and I hope we're going to get there. Because if all we're doing is staying afloat, then I don't know that that was um, the the end uh, outcome that we were looking for from this contract. So, I just wanted to uh, state those numbers, state my opinion, but I, I am willing to uh, um, let it continue to ride, and and I hope that uh, things will get uh, more efficient, better, and uh, move forward. And Director Turner, did you want to respond? I just want to say thank you very much. I am encouraged <clears throat> um, by the progress that we are making. Uh, one of the items that was not really enumerated in the LACO memo, but which is pertinent, is when we get our monthly invoices, they are, they are showing the time that they're logging on the, a multitude of projects. So in any discretionary permit process, be it cannabis or not cannabis, it's rarely a straight linear line. You know, the, the completeness period, the first 30 days that we're reviewing that project that, that Supervisor Sabatier mentioned is actually the essential first step because first we're actually, we're taking a look to see if the application is even worth sending out for agency review yet but we're also taking a look to make sure that it has all the items that are necessary for not only agency review, but then secondarily moving into the environmental analysis. So that completeness step um, is, is vital. We, we can't move forward without it. Um, and it's taking place also not just in LACO, but we're also doing some in-house as well. And that is in order to expedite. So our intention, it was not to just hand over all cannabis to LACO and be like, okay, have at it, guys. You know, it was, it was more of a coordinated effort that needed a little fine-tuning um, when I got here last year. And so we've been working together um, to do that. Some days are more fun than others. Sometimes we're making some tough growing decisions. But I, I am encouraged by where we are now. So I appreciate uh, Supervisor Sabatier's confidence in that. Okay, Supervisor Green. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm also mildly encouraged by the progress, uh, only because I know what it was like before this progress was made, uh, having lived through uh, some dealings on the other side of the counter. Um, and Byron, I thank you for the time you spent with me on the phone yesterday. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, again, new kid on the block, so I'm not totally familiar with the total grant amount that came or how far that's going to get us down the road. Uh, I guess uh, not necessarily an update from LACO, but maybe an update from you about uh, how, how much bang for the buck, uh, but more importantly, how many bucks we have left in the grant uh, before we have to come back asking for more money. Uh, so how much, how much longer do we have? Uh, with this money to try to attempt to deal with this backlog. Um, but, but, but the backlog is the thing, you know. Uh, we haven't been open to truly new applications for several years because of this board's current policy requiring a water board permit as a prerequisite to applying 
So my ears did perk up. If we have 14 more cases that have been assigned, I don't know if those are uh, actual new applications, again, from moldy oldy water board permits that are on board or, or what's going on. So in addition to the concerns about how quickly can we process this backlog, so I am encouraged we have some system and some improvements that maybe we can finally get there. But when are we going to be ready to open up the new applications? And how are we going to find the money to process those? And so this is an open-ended question. I know this item is not the day we're going to discuss this. Uh, but to me, it's an open-ended question. It's the question is whether continuing down this process of all discretionary use permits all the time, even for simple cultivation projects, is the model we want to continue going down, or do we want to explore models that have been used in other counties <clears throat> to varying degrees of success and failure, uh, where we would, would adopt more of a ministerial permit process for any cultivation operations, deal with any CEQA stuff that go with any buildings or stuff like that, and maybe have to fly a programmatic EIR that would provide overarching environmental review of those uh, ministerial permits although I'm not even convinced at this point that DCC is signing off on all those ministerial permits in those counties. So I do want to say I'm encouraged, but I'm also frustrated. Uh, you know, this is basically a, a recitation of a failure to scale this industry appropriately, a failure to, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, we're dumping more and more on this process. On the other hand, we have a cannabis task force being tasked somehow to streamline this permit process that in and of itself uh, is not built for streamlining. Uh, there's a need for speed in processing these permits. I am thankful for LACO and I'm thankful for the grant funding that has kind of righted the ship on our current process. Um, but it's an open question to me, even with the enhancements, even with the help of LACO. Um, that this is the proper direction moving forward. I'm going to set aside all the policy related things, which are rightly left to you all. Um, but the local jurisdiction assistance grant is a three year grant for 1.2 million total. I may have missed a couple, t couple thousand, but I'm pretty sure it's 1.2 million for a three year period, which we have encumbered in an agreement with LACO over the three year period for 400,000 per year. And we're on year three. And I'll get a number of texts in a minute if I said something wrong. Everybody upstairs. But we're going with that. I have it open. Is it real Did quick you want something? Oh, sorry. No way for him. Sorry. Supervisor Crandall? Yes, uh, just uh, wanted to touch on a couple of things. I know I've been, uh, I think you, you've been to some of my Clear Lake Oaks uh, meetings, and so I wanted to relay some uh, input that's been given to me there and uh, just highlight that uh, there was concerns with inconsistencies um, before in different projects, incorrect dates, cutting and pasting, giving the sense uh, to some of the public that there's like a sin of omission. But I know that uh, since... Uh, Community, uh, de community Development Director Turner has started. There's been a policy in place for two planners to review some of those that come forward. So I know that's, that's going to help. Um, and then just in regards to the Cannabis Tax Task Force, um, since August 1st, there was uh, supposed to be a representative to attend those. And looking through the minutes, the, none of them state that there was uh, someone there. So I know that some of these things can be corrected and just want to see you know, I know that you've put some things in place, and I know we're getting to that point, but I just wanted to highlight some of the concerns from citizens about the LACO uh, item today. Thank you. One of the internal uh, systems we have put in place is that uh, the staff reports and documents shall receive peer review before they come to me. Um, and then after I'm done with them, they go to uh, county council for review. That has helped a lot, although that is one of the reasons why there's been a slowdown um, is because we, we do not publish public hearing notices setting dates for hearings until after these staff reports are, are ready to go. Um, so I do anticipate that as we increase in our accuracy and standardize sort of our, our staff reports a little more, um, that that will hopefully move along a little more smoothly. However, um, I will frankly 
let you know that um, I am doing that final review because I have yet to hire a planning <laughs> a, a principal planner or a deputy director. So it, it's it's something that's essential that we do. Um, but I often have my staff sending me reminder emails. Oh, we still have those staff reports that you you know you might want to get to. So it's we're working on it. You. Yeah. Hmm? It's burdensome on you. So yeah, I get it. But I, what, we're making progress, so mm -hmm. it's worth it. And could I also add for the record that we have had a LACO representative at all of the uh, task force meetings. Mm -hmm. We were not appointed as a member of the task force. So um, we're there to advise as necessary and, and behind the scenes, but we have, we have been present at all the meetings uh, as an observer. Okay, we'll just make sure, we'll have to make sure they put it in the minutes for you. Okay, oh, Supervisor Spontier. I just wanted to make a correction. I, I was not correct uh, in the numbers. It's January 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2022 for 400,000. <clears> and then it's fiscal years from July 1st, 22 to June 30th, 23, 400,000. And then July 23 to June 24, 400,000. And then the last one is July 24 to March 31st, 25. Uh, 2025 for 400,000. So it's 1.6 million total uh, and it ends on March 31st, 2025. That's what was approved. Thank you. And in addition, there are also excess funds because the grant totals 2.1 million. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. I will open it up to the public. I don't see anybody in the chambers and we have two hands up in the Zoom room. We will start with Betsy Kahn. You have Three minutes, if you'll state your name, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the board. Betsy Kahn for the Essential Public Information Center. And my question is regarding the statement that was made by the CDD director about the um, modifications to the initial uh, studies. And so my question has to do with whether or not that will fall under a revision of Article 64 of the Lake County zoning ordinances, that uh, it's that's that to me is extremely important to 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 deal with. And could I ask that question? Is that possible, Director Turner? Certainly. If you'll give me one moment to pull up my zoning ordinance. <laughs> I'm not entirely familiar with Article 64 as what the text. You is. don't have it memorized, right? I know. Sorry. <laughs> Environmental protection guidelines. Oh. Certainly, I, I think that I don't have to read that. It would be safe to assume that any the, the the whole purpose of the revisions that we're doing to the initial study is actually to add additional scrutiny to the items that are within the initial study checklist. So it will by by actually improving the quality of our initial study. Uh, I can double check Article 64, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be it will be consistent with all environmental review regulations. Okay, thank you. And then we have phone seven two five seven. Madam Chair, I was just allowed to unmute again, if I may ask a, uh, may comment on that on that answer, please, on Article 64. Okay, go ahead. The article does not contain the initial study checklist that needs to be modified. I would like to be sure that the initial study checklist will be reviewed and have public input before it goes to the Planning Commission because there are a number of things about it that need to be updated. Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate the clarification um, that Betsy just gave because that makes it easier for me to answer. We use the initial study checklist that is uh, supplied by the state within the CEQA guidelines. So um, if it were up to public review regarding those items, then it would have been done at the state level. Okay, thank you. Okay, now phone 7257. You can state your name. You. you have three minutes. Yes, we can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. This is Bart Levinson. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Supervisor Crandall for his comments. His is not the only town hall that uh, has been 
uh, requesting information and feeling not represented at the task force meetings. And I would like to ask more directly, the two people who were given those seats, they themselves are unaware that they are supposed to represent anyone other than themselves. And I would like to ask for clarity about what representation the town halls uh, and the public of Lake County uh, can have, should have, uh, and is having on the task force. Additionally, uh, because the bottom has dropped out of uh, prices for cannabis, uh, the revenue uh, estimates that were at, in 2021 uh, at six to eight million have now plunged to uh, as little as. So 1. this 5. agenda item is about the the LACO process. So if your comment can be yeah. directed to that, and we're we're not talking about the cannabis task force right now or the market condition. So we're, we're just simply talking about the report from LACO. So if you could keep your comment um, within those bounds. That'd be great. Thank you. My comment to LACO, besides that the cannabis is not bringing me in money anymore, is uh, I was at every meeting and we were not advised that LACO was at every meeting and advising all along the way. So there needs to be more transparency, please. Okay, I think that's it for public comment. We can bring it back to the board, Supervisor Sabatier. So I have a, a final question, and I don't know if that can be answered or not. I don't want to put you on the hot spot, but it would be nice to get something back in return uh, in, in the near future. Uh, but if I'm seeing here that, and, and I really personally don't care if projects get denied or if they get canceled or if they get approved, but to finish through the process, right now if we're at 16 and we have about 120 applications to still go through, what is a appropriate amount to expect to be done in a single year so that it doesn't take eight years to accomplish our goal of going through all of these applications? Just kind of curious what your expectations are. And again, you don't have to respond. I'm putting you on the hot seat. But I think it would be nice to set a, a, an expectation so that we can say this is going to take five years or it's going to take three years or it's going to take 10 years. Uh, but at this rate, it just seems like it's too long. And I know that there may be some efficiencies put in place that change that. But I'd also like to know what the internal expectations are. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to go back and give it some thought. Typically, our use permits take up to six to eight months if they're set, ready to go, and don't encounter a lot of hiccups along the way. Um, so I'll take that into consideration along with uh, the staff resources that we have, which we would include LACO in that part since there are our team members on this uh, endeavor. And I would be more than happy to come back and, and give the board an update so you would have sort of a, a more... Uh, thorough um, understanding of, of the speed of what we can expect in this process. And I don't know how the rest of the board feels. I'd love to get consensus on that rather than direct uh, unilaterally. But I also would love to see another report from LACO, uh, maybe not six months. I, I don't mind six months, but definitely don't want to just leave this as is, as I'd like to see this do better. Uh, and so looking for the board to see if they agree on both those items that I requested. So I have a question about the um, applications that LACO is handling that were incomplete and how you're helping um, with the applicants. What percentage of those um, are, 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 are we finding easy, are you finding re easy remedies for or what are kind of have some really big problems and they're, they're going to still take quite a long time to work out? Well, there's a certain handful of ones that I'm not sure are going to go anywhere because the conditions of the market were different when they were applied for, and now there's requirements of the hydrology report that people have, have no intention of moving forward, and we just haven't gotten off the county's books yet. What, how, do you have a number-ish? Uh, I'd have to consult with Andrew on that one, but probably 25 or 30. Um, in addition, to, with, with the rest of them, the fact is, is that projects were getting 
they were all applied for in 2019, 20, and 21. As, as uh, Supervisor Green stated, that we are not getting any new applications. So all of those were applied for in different conditions, different market conditions and different regulatory conditions. So in a lot of ways, it's as simple as going back and asking for a drought management plan. Um, and if they're able to provide that to, for us, um, that's, that's the fix. Uh, others is we just need simply more information to process the CEQA document because we're trying to get port, more information into there. In a lot of cases, projects were designed to early activate and then come back with uh, uh, building permits once they were, once they were activated, um, generated some income, and then uh, had their project approved. When early activation went away, it changed their whole model. So we'll have projects that are on file still and we're waiting for them to, you, know, you need to change your product description in your timeline in order to come back to what is permissible today. So it kind of runs across that, those factors. So the bulk of the projects you have are the more complicated ones and- At this point, yeah, the easier ones have been- The easier have been ones have been moved through. Yeah. Okay. So as when you were putting together a timeline, I mean, that's got to be taken into consideration that these have these um, extra issues and they're not, they're not simple projects. Indeed. Additionally, um, at the state, there is a, um, a part of their regulations that says if, these, if the applicant does not respond to incomplete letters within, I think it's six months, 180 days, then their project is just done. They're, it's just withdrawn. We don't have that in our um, code. However, we have been working on setting aside the ones that are just not moving forward with the intent to take those to planning commission for a recommendation of denial without prejudice, which would then enable the applicants, should they desire to pick it up, um, to do so the very next day if they wanted to, which um, it, it would not include that, that time period, like a, real, uh, like a denial with prejudice. Um, would keep them from reapplying or any other application coming in on that property. So we do have that, that group sort of um, set aside for, uh, for that purpose. Additionally, from the department, the information is that there are 69 projects actively moving forward. 43 of those are with LACO. Should the board uh, decide, we'd be happy to bring you a report back in another six months to see what we've gotten done now that we feel like we're getting kind of all steering in the same direction. Uh, particularly since I just gave you that 69 number, let's see what we get done with those 69. So 69 are active, but are they um, still the very complicated ones? We didn't get that breakdown, but to me, actively moving forward means that we've got the data that we need in order to proceed with environmental analysis and then on to staff report. Okay. Keep in mind the timelines though, um, not to you know be giving you all these disclaimers. However, with initial studies, we do have a required 30 day cir circulation period for the public and the clearing state house. So there are some timelines where even though they're actively moving forward, we're all kind of sitting around waiting for this time period to, to take place. Okay. Any other comments from the board? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Okay, we will move ahead with 7.7. .7. Consideration of the following resolu resolutions to correct benefit language as required by CalPERS. A, resolution amending resolution 2020-149 and resolution 2021-122, establishing salary and benefits in confidential unit, section A, for the periods of October 21, 2020 and to October 20th, 2021 and October 21, 21, 2021, <laughs> and you did that on purpose, right? All these dates. <laughs> to June 30th, 2025. And B, resolution amending, resolution 2020 to 150, and resolution 
to 123, establishing salary and benefits for confidential unit section B for the periods of October 21st, 2020 to October 20th, 2021, and October 21st, 2021 to June 30th, 2025, and C, resolution amending resolution 2020. Dash 151 and resolution 2021 to 124, establishing salary and benefits for management employees for the periods of November 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2021, and November 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2025. And D, resolution amending the memorandum of understanding by and between Lake County Sheriff's Management Association and the County of Lake for the periods of November 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2021, and November 1st, 2021, to June 30th, 2025, County Council. If your board determines to offer these resolutions, I could suggest that if you do so, you may simply offer the resolution in sub A of the staff report, the resolution in sub B, since you've already read them once. You ruined the fun. <laughs> Uh, the resolutions that are before you today are the result of a circular letter from CalPERS regarding special compensation. The upshot of it was that special compensation is commonly misreported, the, uh, and it is one of the factors uh, in determining the amount of employees, at least in Lake County and many other government agencies, their retirement amounts. The information uh, was intended to assist CalPERS public agencies to ensure that Cal special compensation was reported correctly. Uh, after that letter, the language in, in uh, the non-represented employee resolutions and in a number of the represented employee uh, documents was changed and it provided for five steps with longevity after the first step. That replaced the county standard 12-step uh, process. Now, the, the issue is that because people were hired at an advanced step, they would reach step five and that five-year period at a point sooner than someone who was just going through each and every step. According to CalPERS, that created a disparate class. People were treated differently, and they determined that that could not stand. They found it non-compliant with the Public Employees Retirement Law, the Pension Reform Act of 2013, and Title II. Uh, CalPERS determined that, um, as a result, then longevity, which was dependent uh, upon receiving a top, achieving a, a top step as written, was not reportable to CalPERS, and thus that income would not be considered in an employee's retirement. Uh, one employee who was putting in retirement at the time this became known um, would suffer an $800 a month loss in retirement money. So it's a, it's a substantial amount. Also, CalPERS talked about not just people who are retiring or may retire later, but recent and even past retirees going back potentially a number of years. The unfortunate part is this is CalPERS' decision to make. However, um, the former auditor controller spoke with them endlessly and did achieve a compromise. The compromise is the formula that is here before you. Um, this, man, this methodology was selected because it's least disruptive to all employees. It essentially leaves people who were hired prior to October uh, 21, 2020 in the same position as they were. People hired after that would be changed to uh, years of service. And the issues re involving longevity and the potential creation of disparate classes resulting from advanced step hirings would then be resolved and prevented. Um, the alternative to this is CalPERS will simply start deducting from everyone's retirement any longevity that they deem to be unreported. The, uh, my office with uh, Mr. Torres and HR has met with each of the units represented here. In fact, they have, represented, they have met with the represented units and 
and hopefully those resolutions will be coming to you on the 28th of this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Spontier? Just a quick comment. There are many, many changes that the state of California goes uh, through every single year. Uh, these was one of them. Uh, these w this was one of them. Uh, can't speak correctly. And truly appreciate the efforts made by the team, especially our uh, prior uh, auditor controller for helping us clear this up. Yes, this was, this was high resolution math. I don't think anybody else could have done this, so it was wonderful to you. She made a commitment to, to find this compromise with CalPERS before she retired. Okay, and we'll open it up to public comment. I don't... <laughs> okay, none in the chambers. And I don't see any in the Zoom room, so we'll bring it back to the board for action or further comment. I don't see any more comments, so... Madam Chair, I offer the resolution in sub A. Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabatier? Aye. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Green? Aye. And Supervisor Pisco? Yes. Madam Chair, I offer the resolution in sub B. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabatier? Aye. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Green? Aye. And Supervisor Pisco? Yes. Madam Chair, I offer the resolution in sub C. Okay, Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabaltier? Aye. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Green? Aye. Supervisor Paiska? Yes. And finally, Madam Chair, I offer a resolution in sub D. And Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabaltier? Aye. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Green? Aye. And Supervisor Paiska? Yes. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much, Anita. Is that what calendars? Oh, calendars. Go back there. About that. Okay. Supervisor Crandall, do you want to start? I'm going to go down the road. Go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I will. So uh, I'll start with. Uh, so uh, this last week I left Wednesday, traveled to DC for the. The RCRC fly-in is what it was called, the legislative fly-in. It also was connected with the NACO conference that I know Supervisor Sabate is on, but they, uh, they asked me to go and they gave me a tag for RCRC rather than Lake County, but I still went and talked about Lake County things. Um, so we basically briefed uh, legislators and committees um, on issues involving rural counties. Uh, it was myself. Um, Marianne Warmerdam, she's the, her and these other uh, policy legislators are from RCRC State, Stacey Heaton, Tracy, Tracy Ryan, and Pe President Pat Blacklock. And we went with the leadership of RCRC. Um, so we were accompanied also by a staff called the ACG, and they're, they're basically the people on the ground that know where to go and, uh, and uh, assist us with navigating the, the halls. And so we, we met with Senator Feinstein, her staffer, Sean Mullen, where we talked about the Farm Bill, farm bill Rural Title, Forestry Title, Energy Title, and Expanding Rural Broadband, um, along with, uh, uh, let's see, it's called Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. We talked about cannabis banking reform, um, safe rural schools, and payment in lieu of taxes. Um, we then went to the uh, Senate Agricultural Committee, um, discussed policy rev revisions uh, regarding legislation that is updated and considered for the reforms coming up. Uh, same rural title, forestry title, energy title. Um, we met with the uh, Forestry Service Chief, Randy Moore. He's actually from California and has a good re working relationship with Stacy Heaton. Uh, we talked about in, in IRA, BIL, which is Inflation Reduction Act uh, and basic in infrastructure law and, and basically discussed our issues in county. So uh, when Stacy and uh, whoever else was, was talking about the issues um, that they were trying to apprise them of, like uh, tree mortality and uh, whack and stack, they call it, which is what they're doing when they're cutting down the trees and leaving them, things like that. We were explaining how it's affecting us. Also talking about the good neighbor uh, policy, which is in regard to you know, federal lands next to ours and having them work on some of those 
relationship so they can, you know, not not keep us as vulnerable as we are with uh, their lack of, uh, of uh, you know, doing the work. Uh, we also went to Congressman Thompson's office, which, you know, I was like, well, we're going to see him next week. And uh, uh, his assistant rep, Eric Hoffman, is actually they're coming here. They'll be here tomorrow. So um, we, of course, talked to him about the farm bill and um, save rural schools and payment in lieu of taxes. Um, we then went to the Speaker McCarthy's office as uh, as his. Uh, we we didn't go to his speaker's first. We went to his actual office of Congress, and so talked to his staff member Kyle Lombardi about the farm bill, save rural schools, payment in lieu of taxes, and then c cannabis banking. Um, we uh, then went to a tour and we went to the office. It was still, they were still moving in. Um, so it was a lot of empty space in there and we got to go on the uh, balcony, I guess, where, where they, you know, the speaker actually has an opportunity to just go on the balcony and hang out and you see, you know, the, the monument and everything and that whole, uh, the whole, uh, what do they call it, the uh, mall, you know, that whole area. So that was really cool, it was a once in a lifetime deal. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, talking with that gentleman was really helpful. He seemed to be really, even though his, his staff member, he seemed to be kind of, uh, not kind of, he was really uh, engaging. And so it was good because there was a couple of staff members that were engaging and knew, and even if they disagreed, they knew the realm of it. And it wasn't just like, okay, what else? Okay, what else? We're going, you know. So that was a really good feeling. Friday, we went to the EPA meeting, and I realized because I'm on the committee for um, the Farm, Ranch, and Rural Communities Federal Advisory Committee for EPA, that was the, the reason why I got to go, because they wanted to see me in person, because I wasn't able to go in January. Um, and we, of course, talked about our issues with, um, you know, with our rural committees and the problems we're having. And I went over again, you know, the situations with, like, the Army Corps, their relationship. Um, you know, the su super fun fight is another, uh, super fun side is another thing that I uh, like to emphasize with them as well. And, uh, we uh, had a really interesting discussion because a lot of them don't know where Lake County is. So I was busy telling them it's right above Napa Valley. You know, uh, we also, you know, we have a lot of fires explain that. And I says they, they knew where Napa Valley was because they drink wine. And I says, well, if you want to keep drinking their wine, you need to help us too because they take our grapes. And so that, that was my pitch. A lot of them knew and they were like, wow, okay, right above Napa Valley. Everyone knows where that is. So that was one of my deals. Um, after that, uh, we finished up... Uh, and went to the, uh, we did that tour, of course, and then uh, we did go to the Eisenhower uh, White House building as well. Um, and we talked with some staffers that are, they were basically the policy makers of some of these bills that we were, we were dealing with and the policy advisors. And so uh, it was a really, short discussion, but we, we really had to focus on the same things we're talking about, but then giving them um, our uh, experiences. That was one of the things, too, is they really liked hearing from the actual supervisors about their, um, about the problems in their area, but the Stacy, Marianne, and Tracy did, did the, uh, the fill-ins, and the, um, the other group, ACG, really helped with that as well. The NACO conference, uh, that was basically Saturday, Sunday. It's still going on today, or yesterday. Pete Buttigieg was talking to them, and then today I think Biden's talking to NACO. So, yeah, I'd missed those, but it's okay. Um, had to get back here. But uh, NACO conference, um, went to a breakfast for new. I don't know if you got to go to that when you went to. It's like a breakfast for people that have never really attended before, so I attended that. Um, I, thought I, I thought I wrote it down here, but I guess I didn't. But, um, yeah, I went to that. Uh, went to, oh yeah, there it is, first time uh, orientation. So we sat at a table with an ambassador and it was like probably like 100 to 200 tables of new people and you gotta think all the, all the um, supervisors in the whole nation are there. You know, not all of them, but the majority of them. The, it's interesting to see that some of them are called commissioners, some of them are called judges uh, of their county. So it's really cool. I was like, wait, you're, you're a judge? They're like, no, that's what we're called. But um, the ambassador, you just shared experiences on some things that they worked on that helped. The one I sat with, was re I was really glad because he's from Illinois and has had issues with overregulation in his county and also had like a restoration project he suffered through. So I was like, I need to call you. I need to talk to you. I need some advice. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, the rest of the NACO conference, basically, we attended different workshops and steering committees. I was at the uh, Justice and Public Safety Policy Steering Committee. A lot was talked about with the medical jail situation. Um, there was a lot of counties that were really upset with that. That, yeah, that and the medical services as well. So there, there was people that were like, look, <laughs> you know, how long is this going to take? Because uh, our counties can't afford to take care of their medical and things like that. So there's just a lot of people saying that, and then we being me too, you know, so that helped uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Policy Steering Committee. So I, I kind of went back and forth because that was like, it was all day from 930 to 430. So I just kind of went to all of them and they, they talked about the, you know, flooding and, and, uh, and fires, of course, in that one, and so shared our uh, experiences. Then California Caucus is just basically meeting with everybody in California and then um, and whatnot there. So uh, Sunday, uh, the Rural Action Committee I attended, and then I also attended a Veterans, uh, a veterans Steering Committee where we talked about uh, the, uh, uh, where did I put it? It's actually the Veteran Services Offices, and uh, I met a contact there that has some more resources because I said we're we're a county with a lot of veterans, and um, we have a, we, they're pretty effective. Um, and they said, well, you have a lot going, but I have more. So I was like, give me a card, send me information because I'd like to get that information to uh, Saul and the rest of the group. And so uh, yeah, that that was the last one I went to. I didn't go to the Super Bowl party thing because I wanted to get ready. I had to leave at 6 a.m. So, so uh, I, I did that, came back, and here I am. So, um, Niners weren't playing anyway. Yeah, so that's, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No, so this next week, uh, Fish, and, Fish and Wildlife, I, I think that fits on mine. Uh, let's see, we got uh, Worth. Something about John T. Klaus. I think I have a property visit on Thursday. Uh, President's Day, so nothing there. I have a RCRC Executive Committee meeting in Sacramento on uh, Wednesday. Uh, my first one on that. Uh, I did a check-in with the EPA on the Thursday, the 23rd, and then uh, legislative call-in session. That's uh, I think you attend that too, Bruno. And then CAO 27th and the board supervisor here on the 28th. All right. And I have a lot of information, so if you want more, I got it right here, and I got it, you know, so. All right, Supervisor Squatier. Uh So since uh, Supervisor Crandall brought up uh, jail medical, uh, I am uh, working on something with CAO Parker on that, and uh, hopefully we'll bring that to you sometime soon. Just wanted you to be aware that that's something that uh, NACO has been kind of uh, harping on and really wants to see change, so we'll see what we can do on our end uh, to support that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back over my past week. Um, just want to give you an update real quick on the skate park. Uh, so I have met with uh, Robert Geary and Dino Beltran uh, and, and some more of the folks that are interested from the tribal perspective of what the project's going to look like and, and how it's going to be implemented. Um, then uh, we have an online survey right now that anyone from the public can go ahead and go online. Um, and I'll provide that to uh, CAO Parker to see if we can put that on our Facebook page um, so that people can say what they want to see in the upgraded skate park. Uh, that way that'll provide some guidelines for the designers to do the design on February 21st, next Tuesday at 5 p.m. Uh, the American Ramps Company is uh, it's also staffed by professional skaters or prior skaters. Uh, in, in their previous lives, and uh, they are going to be showing off their skills just to kind of make a connection with the uh, skating and biking community, let them know that they're not just designers, they're also users of the parks. And then at 6 p.m., we'll be going into City Hall to look at some of the preliminary designs that they have. Um, then I, on Thursday, went to... Um, the Big Read at Woodland Community College. I want to thank uh, our library uh, and uh, Georgina Guardado for our Poet Laureate for putting all that together. I got to read a poem out of the post-colonial love poems uh, from Natalie Diaz and uh, had a really good time and a fun time doing that. Um, 
for the Clean Water Management Council. Uh, I was there as an alternate. Uh, the City of Lakeport finished their review um, and of the area for uh, stormwater drainage, and now there's opportunities for grant funding and being able to move forward with resolving some of the issues, and it looks like the majority of the issues are all along Martin Street the majority of the time. Um, but uh, taking care of that, uh, backing up real quick also, we had our LTA APC meeting. Uh, as most people will notice, both lanes of the uh, Highway 29 expansion is are open, still under construction though as they finish off the curbs. Um, but I believe May will be the uh, ribbon cutting is what they're looking at to make sure we have the right weather. Um, and so that's that. And then on Friday, um, we had approved a contract with Sunrise for a warming shelter. I made a promise to the COC, and I think I stated it to the board as well, that I would be doing visits there. I have a weekly uh, scheduled visit to go out there and see how things are going, see if there's any support that we need to provide to make sure that we resolve problems before they become problems. Uh, I have to say what I saw was a very nice, warm, friendly, calm environment in there. Smelled really good, food was being cooked. Uh, there's all kinds of donations of food, of uh, uh, prepackaged food straight out of the grocery stores uh, that are being donated. And uh, so at this moment in time, it was a soft opening. Uh, today, there is, I believe, a wedding that may have already occurred at the warming center uh, this morning. And uh, I believe either today this evening or tomorrow is when they have their actual uh, grand opening of the warming shelter. Uh, but so far it, it looked good, felt good, had, they had their policies all put together um, and, and seemed really organized when I went there and I'll be going back uh, every Friday just to check in and see how things are going. Uh, so thank you to the board and COC for putting that together. Um, tomorrow, pretty wide open other than meeting with uh, Mike Thompson over at City Hall in the city of Clear Lake. Uh, on Thursday, starting off with Judge's Breakfast, have a COC Executive Committee meeting, and um, I'll have to check in with uh, Supervisor Green if he's able to make it to the IFT and EMCC meetings. Um, if not, we can try and make something work. I'm also meeting with Adventist Health later on that day, and then uh, attending the city council over in Clear Lake. And on Friday, I will be on KPFC in the afternoon and at 2 p.m. and back at the warming shelter. And it looks like we have another full week of nothing since we have a Monday day off a holiday. So we don't have a meeting on Tuesday the 21st. Uh, looks like I'm going to the Technology Governance Committee on Wednesday, first five commission. I'll be at, as the alternate, just checking in and listening to see what's going on. Lake County Fire Protection District, Knocked Unified School District meeting, Hope Rising Board meeting on Thursday. Um, I've been invited to Woodland Community College to speak during Black History Month. Randall Cole is heading that one up uh, for this year. And... Uh, Hope Rising meeting again on Friday the 24th and checking in at the warming shelter and then coming back on the 27th to prepare for our meeting, meeting with our CAO. And actually looks, yeah, no, we changed the times, which is perfect because I also have a Hope Rising meeting as well. And then Board of Supervisors on the 28th. That's it for me. Vice Chair Simon. So, um, <clears throat> last week attended uh, LTA and APC meeting. Uh, Supervisor Spate kind of gave the report on that already, so attended those meetings. Let me get back to my calendar here. Also had a class and comp meeting on Wednesday afternoon, and then on Friday had, uh, oh wait, Thursday, had math, Middletown Area Town Hall. Uh, there was a presentation from Cal Fire just out to the community, our Middletown area town hall on uh, the fire hazard zone, you know, really trying to get the information out there. Uh, a lot of questions there. Obviously, they will be looking for when we draft our letter from the county side to get out there. If we get that done sooner or later so they have a little chance to look at it, uh, to really talk through making sure that we're addressing um, 
you know, the issue is not just saying, hey, we don't like it. Hey, this needs to be looked at. Look, let's look at the data. Let's really see if we can get some letters out there. So obviously that was a big one, a pretty good meeting, I think, as far as getting the information out. Um, they did ask if they wanted me to send. I w if I needed to be CC'd, every letter is written. I told them no, because I'd probably get yelled at by IT. Uh, but we do need to. I said, if you just give me numbers, that would be great. Um, but just continuing that conversation with our communities as we move forward in the implementation and our concerns with it. So, uh, so we'll continue those conversations. A meeting on Friday. The um, well, I didn't have the meeting on Friday with CAO, but I did have another meeting with um, uh, CDD Director Turner on, on on an issue down in my district or a project uh, that we're trying to bring forward. On Monday, I had the meeting with Susan Parker, our CAO. Today, here at the board meeting, Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Um, you know, if we can end that up with the day. I do know that the Lower Lake Action Committee group is meeting tonight. Uh, Maria Turner will be presenting there. I was committed to it, but I think I'm going to go home instead of getting in trouble. Uh, so on this one, so uh, I'll let Russ Kramer know I won't be there tonight. When I did commit, I was like, oh, it is the 14th. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I am going to be out of town for a couple of days. I'll be back on Friday. Um, I have my meeting with CEO Parker. Nothing on the weekend. Obviously, we got the holiday. So we have moved our risk reduction authority meeting. Uh, I'll talk about that. It is going to be on the um, 27th. Also have uh, a meeting with CEO Parker on Friday. It looks like there's um, a planning session on the 21st. And anybody else, maybe someone else is going to that. Uh, from Anna Santana. Anyone get that invitation? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, on the yeah, 21st. Yeah. So I think I'm going to attend that one. I really like those when we get out there with the community and just get to set through it. So been on through those mental health advisory board, other things. So I think that's just excellent. Uh, also, I may be working with CAO Parker. Just to let you guys know, I'm on the State Board of Fire Services. They have moved the meetings to Tuesdays for some reason. I'm going to go and I'm not sure why, so I'm going to figure that out. <laughs> uh, but I am. I, I, it's from 1.30 to 3.30 on the 28th. Um, depending what it is, I may have to invoke the new rules where I'm traveling. I can get over there in Sacramento, be set up, have the meeting. I was thinking about leaving at 1030 here and then just driving over, but I will keep you informed. I may not be here in person on the 28th uh, due to that other board that I set on. And it is a state board. I'm glad we went over that today. Uh, so there's an opportunity. I know there's only so many, but this might fit the, the perfect situation for that. So I will... I'm going to be here one way or the other. I guess that's the message. And your voice there is important. Yeah, so i uh, going to do that, obviously. Uh, on the 25th, I did miss the Middletown Arts Center. The MAC Center is having a visioning forum from 11 to 4. I plan on attending that, obviously, to set through. I really appreciate some of the, well, just the work's doing. Obviously, we are, in, this board voted. We are an art-supportive county, obviously. I, I Probably getting the term wrong there, but we completely support the arts. Uh, it's really been brought into the community. I think the Milltown Arts Center for South County does a great job of, you know, um, some very powerful exhibits that they've been able to bring to town, you know, and I will be honest, I'm being educated on the art stuff. You know, I am not, I'm very clear about that. I can't draw nothing, but obviously <laughs> I've seen some beautiful stuff, some great community involvement for everyone, and, you know, just want to continue supporting them as they're moving uh, through their processes into the next year. So I think that's that's it for now. Supervisor Green. Yeah, thank you. Um, Start last week just catching up. So last Thursday I was able to attend a mental health advisory board. Uh, enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm looking forward to future meetings. Uh, also attended class in comp. For some reason, it's not on my calendar, but I do remember it. I was there, and we had a lovely chat there as well. Uh, this last Friday, uh, I was able to have a sit down with our cannabis program manager, Andrew Amelung, and I appreciate that time. A uh, uh, lot on their plate, so I want to be supportive of them. Uh, uh, next, uh, tomorrow, uh, I will be in Clear Lake uh, for the meet and greet with uh, Representative Thompson. Um, Thursday, uh, 
I do have EMCC and IFT on my calendar. I will be attending that. I think it'll be kind of an informal thing because we have some uh, Brown Act things to talk about with the MCC and IFT is kind of a hybrid thing. So we're probably going to have some organizational things to talk about there on top of everything already on their agenda. Uh, so because that conflicts with COC, it sounds like Bruno, you'll be able to do that. Uh, 11.30ish, uh, I'll be at Mendocino College. They're dedicating their new illuminated sign, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then we'll be doing a little lunch mixer, and I'll get a little tour of the campus, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Friday, I'll be meeting with the city manager of Lakeport, Kevin Ingram. Uh, do have some time available. I was uh, hoping to do a little drive around the district um, with Director Turner looking at some structural deficiencies in our creeks. Uh, she suggested uh, if Chair Paiska had some time available, we might be able to tag team on that. Uh, but I'll leave it up to uh, whether our calendars mesh on that. I think that would be a really good idea to get some eyes on uh, some of our structures on that. Uh, week of the 21st, so I will be down for CSAC new supervisor training uh, from the 22nd through the 24th. Uh, so I will not be able to attend First Five Commission on the 22nd. So Bruno, if you'd be able to pick that up, I'd appreciate that. Yep. I also had that invitation for the event at uh, Big Valley, but because I'll be traveling that Tuesday, I won't be able to attend that. Um, and uh, we just handled appointments today, so we're going to have our newly reconstituted uh, Scotts Valley Advisory Council uh, hopefully meeting on Monday the 27th um, because of the hybrid meeting formats. They had been meeting regularly at Lakeport City Hall. We may have to do that one more time uh, while we figure out next steps post-COVID. Uh, but traditionally, they had met in person at the uh, Scotts Valley Women's Clubhouse. Um, so we'll be uh, doing some outreach and trying to figure out uh, where we go in the months past. But I think, I think that's all I got to share right now. All right, thank you. I missed something. Can I? Yes. One last thing. Go ahead. Uh, and boy, if they're watching right now, even Mally's going to yell at me. Uh, so the Greenview, uh, yeah. the long-awaited Greenview project, um, they did some soft opening stuff last week. was able to go look at it. What a beautiful facility. I think they're going to be open from the 16th on, uh, open to the public as we move forward. So if you're looking for somewhere in the next weekend or something, beautiful building that they put together there uh, for the community of Hidden Valley. So... Um, you know, get down and check it out. That's what I would say. Exciting, especially for South County area. Uh, it brings into, you know, one of the newest large facilities, I think. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got all these numbers right. I think I was told that when it's opened up, you can do about 250 people. And then the, like, slides both ends open up with the deck and everything. Um, somewhere around three to 400 people could be accommodated in the building. Um, which is pretty cool. So, um, but really nice new facility there. Uh, whether on one side of whether you like the building or not, it is a great addition to Lake County, and um, just a really good place uh, that's going to be opened up. So, I'm really happy for those folks uh, in Hidden Valley in the South County. But uh, you know, always nice to have a new place open up uh, that really shows who we are as a community. And I know other districts will have that stuff too, but. Um, yeah, I just want to say that, and I, I did miss it on my calendar, so. It's been a long time coming. Green, Great. Green view. So, um, we are in the midst of CAL FIRE grant season. The grants are due, um, depending on which grant you're going after, uh, next week, I think, and then in three weeks. So, all of, I've had a million meetings with our local partners on that um, the last couple of weeks. And this week is incredibly full. So if you want to wait on the um, Creek tours in District 5 until I'm available, it, would, it wouldn't be until next week. Um, tomorrow, a gender review. I have a home hardening meeting. No agenda to oh, right. No. Okay. Whew, I don't have to do that. Thank goodness, because I don't have anything available this week. Now I have 8, 8.30 a.m. tomorrow, so. <laughs> um, I, there's a home hardening meeting 
that I'll probably do from Clear Lake so that I can meet with Congressman Thompson. I had to cancel the meeting with Bruce for... Um, Bruce Wilson, yeah. Yeah, Were you, you're not able to make it either? No. Okay, so we'll save him a trip then. Um, and then in the afternoon, meeting with Supervisor Crandall with Fish and Wildlife. And in the evening is the CWA meeting. I don't know, I'm hoping I can make that, but... We'll have to see how that day goes. And Thursday morning is the RCRC CSAC follow-up meeting with PG&E. It's supposed to be scheduled two weeks ago. Um, this is rescheduled. It's in Sacramento, but I won't be able to be in Sacramento, so I will call in for that. I have my first law library meeting at noon. My breakout session, my weekly breakout session with for my NACO training um, I will be at the Middletown Unified Board Meeting, Unified School District Board Meeting at 4, and then get home for the CAC meeting at 6.30. Friday, uh, well, I'm having a follow-up meeting at 9 a.m. with Congressman Thompson's um, D.C. staff, which we had a meeting last week to ask for um, more funding for tree mortality. Then at 10 is the tree mortality task force meeting. And then um, and then I have my NACO Friday session, zone of benefit meeting at two. I have a USF student coming up at three. Um, and I, because this week I've got tree mortality meetings, um, I just want to share the report. I shared it with you. So, uh, Vice Chair Simon, if you want to look up the report, um, the, the USDA Forest Service does their annual flyover. I mentioned that earlier. And so the aerial detection shows um, 590,000 dead trees in 2022. That's up from 130,000 in 2021. And my, Matthew has helped um, look at that data a little bit to provide to Congressman Thompson, but it is significant. And, and we're not even one of the counties that's remotely impacted the hardest. So as we're looking for this money, this report could not have come out at a better time to give us more and more data. That's always what we've been um, putting together. And so this is the, the report that ha lists all the counties and um, all the species, the uh, conifers, and if you see this map, it, it's pretty mind-blowing to see. Um, the whole Sierra is impacted, and the whole North Coast, uh, Trinity County, and Siskiyou County, uh, I think are among the most with trees per acre. Uh, so I, this is, this is going to be as devastating as it is. It's really helpful to us um, in what we've been trying to accomplish or what I've been trying to, what I've been working on for over a year. So I did send that to you yep. and uh, I hope it comes up at the fire board because it has not been a topic at the, uh, at the quarterly meetings with the state task force, the um, fire and wildfire and, and forest health task force. Uh, Stacey Heaton and you know others have been trying to really poke that group and be more proactive with tree mortality and and until this report came out last week um, they we weren't really hearing a lot um, so this should try hopefully change that trajectory hopefully <laughs> I don't know what else is going to take uh, so Friday's lots of meetings um, that I just mentioned and then next oh two the 19th is the Kelseyville Artisans Market. If anyone needs to go shopping on a Sunday, that is open again. Um, next Tuesday, I have a meeting with some CSAC staff and CAO Parker. On the 22nd, I do have a gender review. And I think there was something else that was supposed to be on my calendar that day. And then, and then uh, the only thing I have for next week is getting finishing up my my coursework, and then I have a mountain bike race that I'm going to be heading out to. So then back here, 
Oh, risk reduction authority on the 27th after my meeting with CAO Parker and then back on the 28th. <sighs> okay, we did our calendars, that was intense. <laughs> So now we're going to be going into closed session. We have four items. We have 8.1 is conference with legal counsel, existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, citizens for environmental protection and responsible planning at all v County of Lake at all. 8.2, public employee evaluation, social services director, 8.3, Public Employee Evaluation, Air Pollution Control Officer, 8.4, Public Employee Evaluation, Agriculture, Agricultural Commissioner. Hi, right, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, All right, welcome state back. County Was there any action taken in closed session? Yes, Madam Chair. There was some action that needs to be taken. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion. I move to approve the settlement agreement in the matter of Citizens for Environmental Protection and Responsible Planning, ETAL, ETAL versus County of Lake, ETAL. The county shall pay no monetary damage, damages or attorney's fees or costs. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. And we're adjourned. <laughs>